definitely i'm excited to see uh what we get from both of these teams what sort of uh strategies they're gonna field especially as we go into some unconventional modes that uh, aren't always played especially not at the overwatch league level so i think it'll be pretty exciting to see these modes come out and to see how the teams approach them uh given their unique strengths and weaknesses uh you know who's gonna play what how are they gonna match up on the challenges and then as those challenges bear into the final six on six uh, match then we'll see that impact really play out so these teams have to take it really seriously they have to give it their best um, on the 1v1 and 3v3 stages there we go now of course my epic uh, intro was uh was cut by the fact that i had myself muted uh coming out of the break so sorry about that ladies and gentlemen but uh, good afternoon um, i am mitch leslie and i'm joined by jake lyon and, and jake put it quite well over the next three weeks we will be pitting these teams against each other to decide the current king of texas of course both of these teams are currently featured in the overwatch league so we expect the very best of gameplay from from both of them now let's talk a little bit about what the lone star showdown is in, in detail of course just outside the skin deep level of it being a uh, head-to-head -head between our texas teams because in the overwatch league players get into game and then they play prescribed set of maps but this is a little bit different a tournament is going to consist of two major phases phase one is going to be over the first couple of weeks so it's going to be a series of small team challenges uh four series featuring 1v1 and 3v3 game modes then we move into phase two that is our last week it's the battle for texas our finale event that is a standard 6v6 with competitive rule set on the maps uh that are chosen by the teams who win the respective challenges in the lead up so that is what phase one is decided to do and jake obviously you have a, a you know pretty intimate knowledge of a lot of the houston players you played against a lot of the dallas players and uh, we will get a chance to see them uh sort of go head to head and of course there is a trophy on the line uh not just bragging rights which i hear down in texas are a big deal but a uh, fantastic trophy uh being battled for here by these top teams yeah, I think this is just a great opportunity to delve deeper into the rivalry, you know, like I think um, this has to be the definitive rivalry of the Overwatch League, like the, the most, I mean, most compelling, at least in my eyes. So to have an event that's all about that and, and all about, you know, getting putting these players against each other on an individual 3v3 and six on six basis, uh, I just think it's really exciting and it's a great opportunity to see uh, who really runs Texas. It feels like the most comprehensive way almost to test these teams outside of what we've seen in the league so far. Let's now meet the teams for our next few weeks. First up, it is the Houston Outlaws lineup. Blase, Boink, Dante, Hydration, Dexa, Linksa, Mecco, Muma, Rappel, Raucus, and Spree. Jake, you played side by side with many of these players, and I'm quite sure you expect great things from them over the next few weeks. Definitely. I think there's a lot of talent on this roster, and I'm especially excited to see um, some of the individual plays coming out in the 1v1s, the 3 on 3s, um, some more unconventional lineups, maybe unconventional um, situations for these players to find themselves in where they're probably less experienced, uh, but also more raw. All right, well, we like a little bit of raw, uh, I heard. Let's have a look at the Dallas Fuel roster now. A mix of old and new players. Some have been with the organization for quite some time. Some are newer additions. AKM, Closer, Crimzo, Decay, Doha, Gamsu, Harry Hook, Note, Trill, Unco, and Zachary. Now, the Dallas Fuel historically in the Overwatch League struggled to find sort of big results, but recently they're starting to produce them. Changes to the team uh, over the last sort of few months have really given them a new sort of burst of life. And they even won the last matchup against the Outlaws in the league not one week ago. It went to uh, a best of five though, Jake. Yeah, I mean, that match was just a total knockdown drag out. Uh, one of the best series I've seen in the Overwatch League this season. So that certainly dis didn't disappoint. And uh, I can't wait to see the rematch. I bet Outlaws are hungry uh, to turn that loss into a win. Um, as far as fuel goes, you definitely have to look at Decay and Doha as being some of those huge difference makers, uh, as well as a player like Crimzo, who uh, coming up from contenders really stepped up and is now a force to be reckoned with in the Overwatch League. And I'm glad you mentioned them in general because we will get to see some of those individuals uh, over the next few hours. Let's have a look a little bit more in depth at today's matches. So uh, obviously series one and two are occurring today. We will have 1v1 and a 3v3 challenge. Uh, and of course, for May the 11th, which will be next week, series three and four, and then the Battle for Texas on May 18th. So not only is that airing uh, sort of here on YouTube, but also it will be, it'll be airing on TV for those of you that are uh, local viewers. So that's kind of fun, of course. If you're in Texas, be sure to tune in to WFAA8 
in Dallas or KHOU11 in Houston at noon on Saturday to find out what the winners of our series chose to do with their map picks. You can also check the docu-series about the Lone Star Showdown in general. So uh, a lot of extra content there for you guys. And if you're interested to see uh, what maps are actually going to get pulled out by these teams, of course, they're fighting for them. So you can assume that maybe a little bit more thought is going to be going into them now that they're not just prescribed to them and they play them in the league. We'll see teams try and set up advantageous situations on those maps in order to make sure that they can clinch the prize. Good performance in our first couple of weeks from either of these teams will definitely smooth their road when we come to blows in the Battle of Texas. But let's, Jake, break down a little bit more about how these 1v1s work because obviously it's not a standard game mode. Best of five series in general. Uh, so each map has a best of nine rounds in it. So we'll be playing those no best of nine round maps in a best of five series. Sounds confusing, but we'll get there. Uh, they are 1v1 duels. So each team will select one player for each of those series, the best of five series. So no player can play twice. And the winner of the series, of course, is a water the map choice for the Lone Star Showdown in week three. So Jake, some of those individuals that you mentioned uh, will really get to start their stuff here because there's no substitutions once you're, you're in the match. And, these players are going to be playing head-to-head -head on the same heroes. Yeah, and we've got a total banger to start us off. It's going to be Dante versus Decay. Uh, likely going to be taking us to some Tracer duels here. So that's a raw skill matchup. The 1v1 is especially brutal in the Tracer. Uh, it's all about getting that recall, maximum efficiency, putting the damage onto the enemy Tracer, those blink melees. Very, very high skill matchup here. So both teams want to get that first map win, want to get that map pick rolling. Jake, you definitely had your time on Tracer, you know, playing as part of the Houston Outlaws. And, you know, at a competitive level, it's incredibly intense, quite difficult uh, to sort of produce. But we're going to jump into uh, this first round here, Jake. And you can maybe start to talk us through some of uh, what these two players are trying to do on this complicated hero to get the edge. It's all about really getting the recall forced, right? Like, you want to deal some damage and recall without... Um, going too early. We see the first recall comes out from Decay. Dante gets a little bit more efficiency, but he's still low. Again, coming back with as much health as possible is important, trying to time those recalls as best as you can here. <laughs> They're still trying to type in chat. Oh, Decay and the recall is going to get that first kill. Earlier. That was the recall right there. Decay had his recall up, and then Dante was about half a second from it being available. That's the margins you're working with on the Tracer 1v1. You know, half a second so makes all the difference in the world. You're trying to abuse the window where your opponent, you know that your opponent doesn't have recall. Is that right? Well, if you recall first, right, and the other Tracer recalls just after you, then Decay was aware of that, right? So he knows he's got the first recall available. He forces the fight. And that means that he's able to put the pressure on Dante, get the heal, and Dante can't do the same. Uh, but if, you know, that fight goes one second later, then Dante's in the advantage. So it's very hard to know who's going to win in the end. Both heroes can burst the other very quickly. Well, but Dante does huge damage. damage. That's big. Force an early recall. Dante hasn't had to use his yet. A window between recalls is now starting to turn into uh, what's no longer really relevant now that they're so far apart and that Kale have his cooldown available again. Dante's keeping him low, though. Love that, that uh, the melee on the, uh, on the, the dash forward. Dante with a bit of an bit HP right now. Decay doesn't seem too worried. He knows he has recall. He's, oh, my Decay is playing this very close. Dante, Ooh. oh, didn't have to recall at all. See, that's very interesting. Decay is really going for value with the recalls there. He used three recalls that round, just trying to get those maximum heals out. Dante instead just playing for damage, not worried about using his own recall, just keeping Decay low, keeping the pressure on it. It ends up working out for him there. Uh, but these Tracer Duels, I, I mean, no matter what happens with the recall, even if you're in the lead, you know, the other Tracer could burst you in half a second if you're caught off guard. So these players have to be so focused throughout the entire matchup. How easy is it to one clip an enemy Tracer, especially in a 1v1 scenario like this? Uh, it, it's pretty much not going to happen because both these players are so good, but the potential is there and they both have to respect it. Okay, already to the high ground. Dante now going to be joining him. Couple of blows traded. Dante a little lower. That's his recall force. Decay gets aggressive now, but almost punished for it. Has to recall himself. Big Constantly damage from Decay. Getting He's in a big lead here, but oh! Dante turns it around. Oh. How, was... what, what on earth happened there? Decay is up like 60 HP, and then Dante slips in behind him and just drops like 100 damage on him in an instant. And that, that's the Tracer 1v1. That's what I'm talking about, right? Like, even though Decay's in the lead, He's got a big HP lead. He could play it slow, play it long range. But when you're at point blank range, the damage lead doesn't mean all that much. You die so fast that 
it's having a little bit more HP than your opponent doesn't make the difference if your aim's on point. Now, I know you guys can't see this, but there is uh, plenty going on in game chat as the teams have obviously brought their own spectators <laughs> along. So plenty spot. being talked about in chat. The cave moves up early here. I'm going to be dashing past Dante, who's actually just trying to hit as many melees as he can and be efficient as possible. Down to 84. He's low! No chance to recall. Looks like Dante actually tried to recall, but before the animation began, he was eliminated. Uh, he did recall a little bit earlier there. I think Decay just kind of ran away with that one. Decay didn't even recall that entire round. He just just fought. No fear. It's brutal. All right, well, now you guys know the pace of this kind of matchup and you sort of know what to expect. So we can maybe discuss a little bit of the, the, the finer points here. We may... <laughs> Oh, we, might, we might run out of uh, minutia to discuss when it comes to the Tracer 1v1, but we'll uh, we'll have to see how it plays out. So when you are playing, like in a 6v6, Drake, and you're, you're sort of trying to shut down an enemy Tracer, what does that look like? Are you trying to go in and assassinate them? How do you sort of prevent them from, you know, causing problems in your own back line? Well, the nature of the Tracer duel is uh, a lot different than most heroes. Like, you know, you take like most DPS heroes in a 1v1. It really is about that raw skill damage trade. But Tracer is just so naturally defensive. You can't force the fight with the enemy Tracer. As soon as you blink in, she can always blink out. And then you'll end up just wasting your recall, which is, of course, really, really crucial as a skill. So usually the Tracer duel actually takes place not in terms of a full fight to kill, but really you're putting pressure on the enemy Tracer getting her to recall, and then you're making your own play on one of her teammates. Usually, you're not actually going to go try and finish off the enemy Tracer. Um, usually, you're just trying to push her out, except that she'll be able to escape. But, of course, if you make her run for the hills, you make her go grab a health pack, then no one's controlling the flank. It's your turn to go hit tanks, go for the back line, whatever you want. Um, in this case, they're playing full to the kill with no heals, but if both Tracers have heals, usually neither of them is going to die. Right, I mean, that, yeah, that's an outside factor that we don't really consider and that neither of these players actually have available to them. So requires you to play in a different way. Your only heal is your recall, which sets you back in time and gets you back to the health you had earlier on. And this first best of nine is is looking like it may well go all the way. Uh, yeah, just showing how close these players are in skill. I think um, one aspect of this duel is, is that it's especially slow paced, um, but the key is that you're, it's all about managing that recall, right? Like, if, if you delay the recall, you might end up dealing more damage to the enemy tracer, but then when you actually use your recall, you won't be returning to max health. So you really have to exploit that three-second window to its maximum potential. Uh, you know, I have to decide, is it worth recalling to get that full 150 HP, or do you want to put some more damage in, uh, let's say, after the other tracer has recalled? Uh, it's not so easy to keep track of that, so both of these players' skill set really put to the test. As we see, ooh, this round's going very aggressive. You know, Dante there, he recalled back to a point in time just after it started taking damage. So he only comes out with 138 at that point. But yeah, I guess there's merit then into just trying to slowly chunk, uh, you know, an enemy tracer down in increments instead of trying to go for the full kill because the quicker you do damage, the more they'll get back. And Decay looks comfortable now. Yeah, Decay picking up a bit of a lead in the series here. It's interesting to see the players taking slightly different approaches each time. That round we saw both players push through the lower tunnel area uh, very, very aggressively. Usually they've been fighting for control of the high ground. I don't know how much map position really matters here. We have not seen the point control open. Uh, I don't expect that to happen. Of course, Tracer with no self heal isn't going to last for long. Well, back we go. And this one's starting a little bit closer now. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll be honest. Doha, uh, Doha is giving Decay uh, a lot of smack for uh, to his teammate in the chat here. That's so, uh, the guy he's focused on the game now, taking it entirely seriously. He's a little bit low now. If he recalls, yeah, only a little bit more health back. Dante now going to take his opportunity to recall it. Again, it helps him keep uh, the clocks fairly similar. Dante will see his re recall come up and know that Decay's will be available at pretty much the, <laughs> the same time. That's it. The Dallas Fuel take this one. Decay from long range actually burst Dante down and quite a close trace to duel and uh, a lot of uh, minute details that we don't often jake get a chance to explore in a 6v6 format yeah definitely we get to see the fine speciality of the hero i think one thing that's interesting is when uh, decay picks up an hp lead uh, he's a little bit ahead of them he just stays at maximum range it makes the damage really consistent from both tracers right you're not going to get bursted down if you're playing in extreme range and as long as you have the hp lead 
You just kind of grind it out, play it slow, uh, force the other tracer to push into you, which should give you an advantage cooldown wise. But I mean, we saw how close those rounds were, even when uh, one player had an HP lead. Sometimes they just get bursted down so quickly. Um, those blinks, it's really, it really is the finer points of Overwatch. I mean, you're, you're, you're dropping in half a second if you're actually gonna take that damage at close range. So you always have to respect the other tracer. Um, it's a good start to the 1v1. Pretty difficult one to figure out what's going on, to be fair, in terms of hero matchups. Um, one of the most chaotic anyone, possible. I don't think anyone has written a book on Tracer 1v1s because conceptually, that kind of mindset has no place uh, right now, uh, you know, in 6v6, right? It's a, a very separate sort of skills challenge. Uh, but we do have a winner, of course, and the Dallas Fuel take the first map in this best of five overall. Still many, <clears throat> excuse me, opportunities for the Outlaws to pick some up as we go to different matchups and, of course, uh, different sort of hero picks now. So our next matchup is actually going to be featuring uh, Moomer and Gamsu, which is... Uh, going to be a little bit of a different flavor for everybody a little bit more of a, a, a tank duel and uh, they'll actually be going head to head on reinhardt which is going to be a lot of fun uh, the map is going to be eco point antarctica so a little bit more close quarters a little bit more corners so we should expect to see some wild charge i don't want to disappoint you but i expect this to be a fire strike spamming session uh, generally speaking, I think that's how that's how this matchup plays out. Fire strike, you have to put the Ryan, enemy Ryan low, and if you get ahead in the fire strikes, then they're pushed to go very aggressive and, and try and bring the game back. Uh, but usually, it's going to be very positional, and it's quite interesting because Reinhardt's such a big model, he's pretty easy to hit with the fire strike. Uh, but of course, it is a mirror match, so uh, both Ryan's sure. going to be dancing around trying to get that edge. Very quickly, of course, a huge shout out to our presenting sponsor, Samsung for without whom putting on a show like this would be impossible. So big love to them and thanks for your support here for uh, for Overwatch uh, in Texas. And of course, uh, for these teams going head to head, it's a great opportunity to see uh, some of the individual skills that don't often get to be put under the microscope outside of a 6v6 setting. And of course, helping us put together a 6v6 culmination uh, at the very end of this series. That's gonna be a lot of fun and this is only really drumming up hype for it. So thank you, Samsung. And we're jumping back into it in just a moment. And and yeah, I guess, you know, fire strikes will definitely be the bread and butter for these two. It's a little bit too risky to try and go in and trade, especially when you're up against a hero that does the same amount of damage. Maybe we see gambits with charges. What what if, Jake, if, if one of these players does go low in the fire strike battle and they decide they have to make a play? Is, is it reasonable that they actually try and go for that level of aggression with a charge to try and tip the scales? I think it totally is. Like if you fall behind in the damage trade, you can't swing it out. You know, there's no way that the other Ryan's gonna miss you. So uh, this actually might be an opportunity to see these players' mechanics on the range of Reinhardt's hammer. I mean, that's a, something that I think is often misunderstood in Overwatch. It's actually one of the most complicated primary weapons in the entire game in terms of how the range of um, those hammer swings actually works. Um, you know, the, the, the way it, it actually hits is really uh, awkward. It's not actually max range where you're looking. It's slightly longer range to the left and the right of where you're actually aiming. So based on where your hammer is in the swing, you have to aim uh, at a different position relative to the enemy Reinhardt to give yourself that maximum range. So uh, it's possible we'll see the melee duel come into effect. And I know uh, okay. anyone playing Reinhardt in the Overwatch League has a great understanding of those mechanics. So um, we'll possibly see a player drop low and or the player with the HP lead try and swing it out and potentially get baited into a charge. So I think it's a very realistic possibility. All right, I'm looking forward to it. We're going to jump in now to Eco Point Antarctica in just a couple of moments where it'll be Muma versus Gamsu going head to head on the Reinhardts. And we talked about Tracers and, you know, playing in under competitive settings, maybe not always looking for each other. This matchup is a very different story. Reinhardts are always trying to keep an eye on each other. We're quite often trading directly with each other and what we sort of coined as the neutral, which is when the two shield bearers move together and try and get a health point advantage against them. And that in itself is a, a microcosm of uh, different interactions and mechanics. And hopefully we get a chance to explore them here in this head-to-head. -head. Yeah, I think of the tanks, this is definitely the most interesting uh, 1v1 battle. Um, Muma rocking the spark oh, skin, okay. looking pretty <laughs> All right, no no outlaw skin. He wants to wear the pink Reinhardt skin. It is a good omen, to be fair. The pink skin Very masculine, you got to admit. So early on, we see a fire strike sent off by Muma here. Gamsu opts to take the high ground. Uh, apparently he thinks this is Star Wars. That's fair enough, considering it is the fourth today. May the fourth be with you, everybody. And Moomin now 
will approach him. That is a fire strike connection. So moving now behind a little bit in the health points. He does go for a charge. Just, that's a huge risk. Gamsu's so far ahead now, Jay. Can, he knows he can just push in and win. Yeah, that's exactly what happens there. Muma going for the YOLO <laughs> charge, falls down one fire strike. I think down one fire strike, uh, it might make sense to keep keep battling, try and just get another good fire strike on the opponent. Um, but Gamsu makes exactly the right play there. As soon as the charge is down, there's pretty much no way Muma can come back in melee range. And that's how this goes, right? If you get that HP lead, you want to melee it out. So that first fire strike is really so critical in this matchup, determining uh, if you have to run for the hills, play passive, and try and somehow come back, or if you can... Just go in for the swings, the simplest way to close it out. Realistically, maybe Muma could have backed off and just tried to find an unanswered fire strike to equalize in health points, but we know Muma as uh, quite an aggressive player in his own in his own right, Jake. I guess uh, what kind of what kind of Reinhardt play would you characterize him as outside of that, having played with him? I definitely think as a tank player in general, he wants to be aggressive. Now we see both Ryan's training that is right out. Oh, the, this is a true, a true Lone Star showdown here. The yeah, standoff at mid-range. I see the tumbleweed even in Antarctica somehow. That's how powerful this uh, cowboy energy is. But Muma does take the first strike. Both just trying to bait it out. And they're trying to play corners here as much as they can, Jack. See Muma just trying to play around the edge and try and find a hammer swing. Try to go for a close range charge, but he's in trouble now. Oh, Gamsu kind of dominating right now, coming way <laughs> ahead in the fire strikes. I mean, Muma going yeah. for these risky charges. If, if it works, he wins, but it's going to be so difficult to catch a player like Gamsu with that play. They, they both are aware of the potentials of charge. They know how dangerous the skill can be, how you can pick up a hero, how you can bounce them away. So uh, I honestly think the fire strikes are going to be so critical here, and, and Gamsu's had the edge so far. I mean... Gamsu, of course, for those who don't know, has been a professional esports competitor over three different regions, Europe, Korea, and now North America, over multiple titles as well. So a very tenured, uh, a very tenured existence for him in this space. But Gamsu has an early lead here. We saw the movement try to set up a short charge last round, but uh, I guess he didn't want to give as much notice to Gamsu to get out of the way. Muma with the classic faking AFK to bait some cooldowns. <laughs> At this range, there's pretty much no way to hit a Reinhardt without some next level mind games. Muma attempts it there. We'll see if Doha, or sorry, Gamsu can turn it around. Ooh, oh, we'll Doha, predicts sorry, the worry. juke. Muma's not happy about that. Gamsu, knowing Muma would move slightly to the left, he's able to connect multiple fire strikes onto him now. And again, Muma is falling behind now. Metal Fortitude needs to come to the fore here for Muma. Need some of that Kachow energy, Jake, because uh, I don't really know how he's supposed to make up this kind of deficit outside of just hitting a charge. Yeah, I mean, this is a position where you'd expect to see the charge come out, but Gamsu just respecting it. You know, Gamsu doesn't ever have to go in. He can just slowly close this out, fire strike after fire strike. Gamsu, though, wants to get aggressive. This is a very dangerous place to do that, that, that though. This thin bridge, very risky for charges, but Muma calls one fire strike back here. Yeah, Gamsu trying to make it hard for Muma to predict the fire strike by, you know, sort of swinging his hammer. You can interrupt the animation and throw a fire strike and catch the enemy off guard. Now, there'll need to be a point captured as time ticks down. That's how 1v1 works. So after a certain period, you need to stand in the point and fight. And Gamsu just wants to hammer swing now. This could be a mistake. No, the fire strike. Ooh. Without that, Jake, I think he may have lost. Yeah, Muma was clawing that one back. Brought the HP down to even for the point contest, so... You know, it is very possible. I think Muma just needs to keep his cool, not go for these risky charges. Seems like every Ryan that's gone for a charge has been heavily punished. So uh, it might just be a true fire strike trade until you can swing it out on point. Um, but yeah, good point there. I think it was because Muma had just fire struck, he didn't have it ready for the combo and Gamsu was able to get the damage out just a little bit quicker. I mean, uh, swinging the hammer and a fire strike, what is that, 175 damage? Uh, yeah, you're correct. Well, slightly different with armor, but um, at that point, both Ryan's are low, so it makes no difference. I mean, usually there's going to be so much overkill in this matchup. Ryan doesn't really have any way to deal small amounts of damage. Ooh, that was close for Muma. Yeah, again, just trying to set up the corners. It's just going to be a straight swing now as well. The charge, okay, that might have cost Muma. Yeah, while he's charging, he's not swinging. Gamsu gets a free hit there, and with Fire Strike available, he's able to get a quick burst down combo. This is the last chance, Matt. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Matt. <laughs> Jake, for uh, for Moomin to actually get a W in the column. Yeah, we'll see if he's able to turn this around. I think Moomin just needs to play it slow, play cautious. You know, he, he, he clawed that one round back so effectively, just 
letting Gomsu tire himself out, letting Gomsu get over aggressive. You've got to be so patient in this matchup. It's it's uh, really just in, in critical nature of it. If you get that fire strike lead, then you hit the first swing. Then I mean, you're just destined to win uh, as time plays out. So, you know, we haven't seen a single successful charge showing. Uh, you know, usually in Overwatch League, you're pretty much only going to pin the enemy Ryan when you have some setup from your teammates. But Kamsu's there is enough. hiding. I don't think Muma's seen him. Oh, they both see each other there. Now, a little bit risky for Gamsu because he can't actually see around a corner without <laughs> his shield up. So he couldn't see Muma go for the fire strike. And we didn't it's get too funny strike. to see him when they both use fire strike and they know there's absolutely no threat on the other. <laughs> they just crouch <laughs> walking around. <laughs> oh, the crab walk. It's too funny. Again, it's the term that we've coined as Rhine games. There is a, a lot of, you know, uh, many mental blows traded between Reinhardt's in, in any sort of scenario. I think Reinhardt players are a special breed. There's a certain sense of uh, pride over the hero and, and, you know, pride about being out of control space and, you know, being able to you'd be one step ahead of that enemy Reinhardt when it comes to, uh, you know, your charges or how you use those fire strikes. Oh, unbelievable! Gumsu didn't quite connect though. Muma didn't see that charge coming because Gamsu was able to break line aside by charging through the room. Muma is fortunate. That was that was wild. That was a I respect that play from Gamsu. I, I have a total respect for that. Going for the over the head fire strike there. That was close. Ooh, Muma, lucky. Oh Dangerous. no, the counter pin! He got him! Muma, huge damage taken, and now there's no way he can win the Reinhardt Hammer duel after that one. And this is what you mentioned at the very start. You said, Mitch, don't get your hopes up, even though that was maybe wrong because I got plenty of charges, but charging makes you vulnerable. It sets you in a prescribed direction for a certain period of time. And if the enemy Reinhardt hasn't used charge, he can line up his own charge. And there's a large period of time after charging that you can't act. And Gamsu punished that, uh, I would say, to the nth degree. Yeah, Gamsu just dominating this matchup right here. Dallas Fuel up 2-0 right now. We'll see if the Outlaws can bring it back, but it's looking grim for them in this 1v1 challenge. I think Gomsu's patience there just paid off so heavily. He was just playing the positional game, staying near cover, making it awkward for Muma to land the fire strike, and just grinding it out. And over and over again, you know, a small deficit for Muma, one or two fire strikes, turns into a round loss because he's forced to go aggressive. Uh, he's forced to try and trade swings. And when you're trying to push into the enemy Ryan, the enemy Ryan can just, you know, kite you back, fire strike you down, wait for the right moment to finish you off. and. Uh, you know, little small edge at the start turns into a big victory. Bear in mind as well that, you know, these these battles now fall into a best of five. So as far as that overall series is concerned, Dallas Fuel currently lead two to zero and the Outlaws are, may only have one more opportunity to try and stay competitive. Otherwise, that first map pick is going to go over towards the Fuel and there'll be uh, not a whole lot they can do about it. They have to try and redeem themselves later in the 3v3. Our next uh, matchup, which we'll, we'll get to on the other side of the break uh, is actually going to be Doha versus Blase on Doomfist. So Jay, give us a bit of a teaser what we should expect from that. Okay, the Doomfist matchup is going to be much more explosive. Uh, a little bit similar to the Rhine. I'd expect to see the primary fire just trading at range at the start, um, forcing the enemy Doomfist to be the one to initiate so that you can use your skills to just escape and then put some counter damage in. But as the round goes down and both players drop low from the spam, it's going to come down to the cooldowns, the ability usage, uh, and the headshots. So this is going to be, I think, a very interesting matchup. Um, we'll see how each team plays it out. Yeah, there's going to there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of sort of micro interactions here. We got some highlights uh, from that last round, and you see Muma able to connect that fire strike there and actually put him on even footing with Gamsu. But Gamsu comes barreling straight around the corner, hammer swinging as well. Both are able to trade and that fire strike, that fire strike cooldown that Muma actually had available there. Uh, Jake, he didn't actually have a chance uh, or chose not to use it. Yeah, and trying to finish off with the final swing, but that just was how close that match was. I think that was uh, a couple milliseconds from a swing connecting for Muma. So um, just the nature of the Ryan 1v1, very chaotic, very unique battle. I just think the Doomfist 1v1 is, might, might be one of the most ideal 1v1s besides heroes like Widowmaker that are, are kind of obvious for, uh, well, everybody understands that one, the sniper duel. Click their, click their head, just click it, no problem. <laughs> Well, yeah, we can we can give it a little bit of a teaser before we uh, before we go to a quick break, uh, Jake. What what are you going to be looking for? What, what should everyone at home be looking for in a in a Doomfist one v one? Well, similar to the Ryan one v one, I think it's all about. 
putting the enemy in the position where they need to go aggressive first because it's quite elementary for either Doomfist to dodge the other one. Uh, like you're never gonna land a charge punch in mid range because the other Doomfist can just uppercut or uh, play high ground or, or you know dodge in a myriad of ways. So you wanna spam the other Doomfist with the range weapon, with the primary fire, put them in a position where they're behind and they need to get aggressive. And then you can kind of dance around them and have that final trump card uh, when you're trading cooldowns, you want to have that last cooldown to settle the score, pick up the shields. But landing any cooldown, so, so impactful, of course, giving yourself HP at the same time as taking it away from your opponent. Uh, that can lead to really big swings in this matchup. That's it. Doomfist mains everywhere. I hope you have your pen and paper out and be taking some notes. Because after these messages, we will be back with map number three in our 1v1 challenges. A chance, perhaps, for the Outlaws to swing things back in their favor and give themselves a shot at choosing their first map in our 6v6 showdown. We'll be back, though, right after these messages. Lone Star Showdown, presented by Samsung. Always gaming, always Texas. Stay connected and stay gaming with the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra 5G. Shop online or through the HEB app to purchase your groceries today. Here, everything's better. Houston Outlaws and the Dallas Fuel wish to thank Samsung for presenting the 2020 Lone Star Showdown. Follow us over the next three weeks to see who is named the top Overwatch team in Texas.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Lone Star Showdown. We are already two maps of our 1v1 tournament in. And of course, this may be a decider in this series, Jake. So far, we've seen Tracer 1v1s and the Reinhardt 1v1s. And coming up next, it's Doomfist head to head. Yeah, I think Doomfist is uh, well positioned here. It's almost like a mix between the two, right? A little bit of Tracer, a little bit of Doomfist. Uh, more of that range trading, but also some of that point blank dueling. Um, you know, when the fight breaks down, when both Dooms have to play at close range, that's when we'll get to see real mastery of the mechanics of the hero. Um, I'll be interested to see how these players play it. You know, you might just feel it out, play it nice and slow at the start. Um, but you can also get very aggressive and try and catch the other Doom off guard. Both strategies, I think, are very viable. Uh, it really is more about how they want to approach it. Uh, probably expect the, the slow play to be a bit dominant. Uh, push the other Doom to make the first move. Now, Necropolis is going to be our map here, which features a large amount of high ground. So keep an eye on that one. And of course, let us not forget a big thanks to our friends at HEB for making the Lone Star Showdown possible as we see Blase and Doha go head to head. And these are arguably two of their best heroes. So we get a real treat here. And of course, the customary and they say spam to open the battle. <laughs> so both players setting up on the high ground. I don't know where Blase is going. He's riding the walls on this map. I don't know. The Doom rollouts here are pretty epic. Both trying to bait us some cooldowns here. Blase faking the slam. And that's why you fake the slam. Rising uppercuts here. Blase able to catch Doha as he tried to come in through the slam. Both get uppercuts. Doha looking for a rocket punch. Blase is able to reposition. Doha now drops to the low ground briefly. He's used his rising uppercut, so he can't come up for another few seconds. He's going to take the stairs like everybody else. Pretty sure we've got an honor duel. No left click first first life here. No, neither Doom is using it, so pretty sure that's the reason. Doha tried to come back in this one. I mean, Doha, the rocket punches wasn't charged up much at all. Mutual knockdowns. Both go for uppercuts. Doha low, and there it is. Blase finishes the job. But he was well ahead in health at the start of that. And yeah. If we had left clicks available, I think that would have been much quicker for Blase. Yeah, I actually think this is way more fun. I hope they continue to do this. The, the no left clicking makes this duel way, way more exciting. I think with <laughs> left clicks, when I played this uh, 1v1, it tends to be mostly about the left clicks, trading spam at long range and just using your cooldowns to escape the other Doomfist. But uh, this is way more interesting, actually, with the, only the cooldowns. This really feels more authentic now. Doomfist is actually played in a six on six environment. It feels much more like a fighter now between these two, right? With no, with no sort of projectiles at all. Obviously, Doomfist has access to those uh, and they, they are very helpful. But right now, these two, two students of the art of the fist, I guess the gold fist, the iron fist, depending on what skin that you have. Okay, notice some left clicks this time. So they're uh, they're allowing that. Doha has the high ground. So I'm going to be saying that a lot today. Mutual knockdown. Ooh, both solo. Ooh, the turnaround from Blase makes the retreat. Doha dropping 0-2 right now. I mean, that was a very close round. Uh, Doha actually had an initial HP lead, but it was a nice rollout from Blase jumping over his head using the slope of that wall to. Uh, equalize and eventually return for the fight win. Let's talk about rollouts as Doomfist, Jake, because normally it's not something that we really, you know, think about much with any other hero, but for Doomfist it's quite important. Yeah, your mastery of the skills. I mean, Doom is actually one of the most complicated heroes in the entire game in terms of the amount of mechanics there are. Uh, one of the most important is that the punch, If you when you jump out of the punch, you retain a ton of momentum, and you can use that momentum to bounce up to high grounds as Doha already to the high ground, saving both crucial cooldowns. That makes a big difference, and now he's right over the top of Blase. Blase uses everything just to get here. I don't expect to see him commit, but Doha now giving up the high ground on his own. What Blase just did is actually much more complicated than some people realize. Doomfist interacts really interestingly with sloped surfaces, and they often help him curve or even uh, sort of raise his trajectory right while he's rocket punching. Normally, you'd have to use uh, Rising Uppercut to actually get verticality. You can do it with the punch if you uh, use the right surface, and Blase is all over this, like moss on a rock, Jake. I don't know. I mean, Doha has been a solid Doomfist all season long, but, but Blase has been... The reason that some matches have come down in favor of the Outlaws. I mean, this guy has been a superhero on the Doomfist time and time again. And he clutches up one more time. I mean, up 3-0. Outlaws looking like they want to put their mark on this best of five at least. I mean, uh, Fuel's still up 2-0. So I, I want to see more. And Blase is going to give it to us. It looks like that. 
like much like the tracer battles do is, are they always looking for each other uh, across the battlefield or are they trying to focus down larger easy to hit targets uh, this is a very interesting matchup because you can either completely ignore the enemy Doomfist or go for the aggressive trade on them. Um, you can play Doomfist very defensively and just seek to, like, protect your allies from the opposing Doomfist. Looks like Doha's got this round, though. Yeah, um, a couple more left clicks. But uh, there's there's different styles to play on Doomfist. It really depends more on your teammates, I think. Um, if your team has the advantage in, in aggression, like, you, you need to dive in and need to get kills, then you'll probably ignore the other Doomfist and go for other weaker targets like Backline um, or the other DPS. But um, if your team is going to be successful in the defense and you're marrying Doomfist, then you might actually just look to stay with your teammates and use your cooldowns only to counter the other Doomfist. You know, counter punch their punch, uh, pull them out of their uppercuts or, their, or uppercut them out of their slam. You know, the, the cooldowns can be really effective either aggressively or defensively. So we're going to see both styles here, I expect. Doha very quick to the high ground. Nothing too fancy about it. Just a rising uppercut to get there. Blase, so far staying undetected. He's actually crouch walking. So his footsteps are extremely hard to hear. And Doha is a little confused up until this point. <laughs> Blase had been presenting quite happily uh, for the 1v1. So there's an extra element now of stealth. Now Doomfist, maybe not consider the most stealthy character. Sometimes when you have a ton of metal hanging off one of your limbs, uh, you know, Maybe you roll stealth checks at disadvantage. Yeah, the, the literal rocket-powered fist. Oh, <laughs> Doha missing the scout. Do Blase sneaking up on him. Doha's oh, running no. around, so Blase's going to know exactly where he is. I think there was a little bit of jangling and jingling that he probably heard from Blase as he tried to cross the stairs. Blase's punch doesn't connect, and over the head he goes. Doha drops on down. He's a little bit lower. Blase only needs a couple left clicks to finish it. Charging the punch. He had to go for a gambit, Jake. It just doesn't pay off, and... I guess Blase, the best laid, laid plans in this case, don't actually go to waste. Yeah, I mean, the, the sneaky play gets him the damage lead, and then Doha's forced to go over aggressive, so uh, I like that Blase changed it up there. Playing aggressive for the first four rounds, as soon as he drops around, he changes his style completely, plays defensive, plays passive, sneaks up on Doha to get an early lead, uh, and that can really wear you out. It, it's a bad feeling to be the Doom that, uh, that was just left searching around the map the whole game <laughs> and then immediately bursted down, right? Like... So Which definitely, mentally soul, speaking, Blase has a bit of a lead. Now the counter punch, Jake. You mentioned that earlier on. Here, it maybe isn't that important as both Doofus knock each other down when they hit each other with rocket punch, but in 6v6, it's important. Yeah, definitely. This time, though, Doha's heavily punishes Blase's hiding strat. Doha immediately charges in, guesses Blase's location, and the payoff is huge. So Doha should be bringing this back. Blase here with a rising uppercut, and Doha actually screams past Blase during his seismic slam and then turns 180 to make sure he actually hits it. Uh, that is that is quick, but again, you gain extra damage based on... Was it the distance that you travel during seismic slam or the, the vertical distance you travel, Jake? It's actually the time you spend in the seismic slam, technically, ah. because there's certain bugs that allow you to like stick on walls and stay in the seismic slam, and then you deal like max 125 damage. Um, but they've actually just done a patch recently that, that changes the way you can actually do that. But it is technically time in the air. All right. Well, this could still be match point here as Doha is still trying to keep the Dallas fuel in it. Blase, if he wins this round, the Outlaw will stay alive in his best of five series and will still have a chance to choose the first map in the series when it comes down to the 6v6 on the 18th. Nice hit there, though, with that seismic slam. Blase is able to find a rising uppercut, but not nearly as much damage as Doha. Got a ton in there, 125. Blase has to use seismic slam to stay on the map. Doha now is chasing, comes up behind him. This one's starting to heat up now. Four to three. Still one more round required here for Blase, but Doha is gaining. Definitely, Doha bringing things back. Blase might want to go back to his aggressive ways. Seems like that was working out the best for him. The last two rounds have been all Doha pretty much running over Blase pretty quickly. And I have to agree with Doha's strategy here. Just moving quickly to that middle high ground, it might be the most valuable position on the map. From there, you can rotate very easily to either side of the map with only the punch. Uh, and cooldown management is really the, the centerpiece of this matchup. If one Doom finds himself in a lead with cooldowns, they can pretty much go all in aggressive. And there, here we see now Blase matching that aggression. Doha, though, gets the better of him in the early trace here. And he's just going to finish the job easy. It's four to four. And we get a deciding round. 
Jake, you mentioned cooldown management. I guess it's worth pointing out that Doomfist's mobility is directly tied to having his abilities available. And if he uses them all quickly, maybe to try and position somewhere, he won't have them available to try and deal damage. Now, the cooldowns aren't long, right? But there are still windows as Doomfist where you can get caught out in the open with, with no mobility just from being frivolous about your abilities, right? Yeah, I think the biggest problem with, with running out of cooldowns in this matchup is that Fight. It, it snowballs. A, a small advantage snowballs into a big one. If you are, le are behind on cooldowns, you can't take the fight, and you have to keep using cooldowns just to run away. Uh, and that's what leads you to be really, really far behind. Doha now has the high ground over Blase. Blase's in a rough position right now. But yep. Doha baited to the low ground. Oh, and a big trade of left clicks for Blase. He gets punched into the wall, oh, but he turns it around. Jake, I mean... Uh, Blase goes so low early on in that round. He actually takes a huge hit and goes down to half health. How did he bring that back? I, that was really impressive train of left clicks. I think he got all four left clicks when he contested the high ground. He got all four right on center mass on Doha. And, and that makes all the difference in the world. Doha even lands, I believe that's the first back wall punch we've seen uh, in the entire series. But still, it's only minimum charge. So Blase is able to stay alive, turn it around. Harsha says, number one Doom in the chat. I feel like that's important for all you at home to see. <laughs> no, that's right, yes. Yeah. So we, I know uh, someone on Twitter did ask for match chat. Uh, we will keep you updated of all developments that are occurring there within reason, so fear not. We can relay the messages from the players here. It's mostly Crimzo just uh, just making things up. Like, oh, he's unplugged his mouse. Oh, he's unplugged his monitor. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, guys. So the Outlaws managed to claw back a series now, which means it's two to one in our 1v1 matchups. Dallas Fuel still on the precipice of taking things away, but our next head-to-head -head is going to be quite interesting. It is going to be a Zenyatta head-to-head. Of course, shout out. Thank you to HTV for making the Lone Star Showdown possible. But Zenyatta, it's going to be Crimzo versus Rappel in this matchup, and this is a much different flavor. We actually have a support 1v1 now, Jake. Yeah, this is, I mean, a support 1v1. I'll say, I'll say that's, that's more of a technicality in this matchup. I mean, Zenyatta is only a support by technicality. Uh, the hero is obviously insanely high damage dealer. Uh, the only real nuance I think in this matchup is about the Discord orb, but um, these Zenyatas are top players. They're going to be permanently discording each other. Um, if you can somehow get an advantage in the Discord, put the Discord on the enemy Zen um, without being Discorded yourself. Somehow, if you can manage that, it's a massive advantage because, of course, the Discord gives you that um, wall hack, gives you that location on the enemy player, which in a 1v1 matchup is pretty much the most valuable thing you could ever have. Um, but this matchup is incredibly explosive, right? The, the right click, the charge up fire from Zenyatta is just devastating. You can completely destroy the other Zen in one shot. So uh, if you actually can land all those orbs, um, this is gonna be really, really interesting. Very raw mechanical duel. You land the headshots, you win, you miss them, you lose. All right. So maybe not unlike the uh, McCree matchup that we will have if it's needed in map five between Linkser and, and Zachary. Now, that is uh, something that may happen. But yeah, of course, Discord Orb is based off of line of sight. So uh, it's not exact. You don't have to aim it, really. I mean, within a certain degree, you do have to have the enemy Zenyatta on your screen or close to the middle of it. But yeah, there's not uh, a ton of nuance to that, as Jake mentioned. We're heading now into Black Forest once more. But the Dallas Fuel, Crimzo, is going to try and take this away. Of course, Crimzo is a Canadian World Cup representative and a more recent addition to the Fuel roster. We're starting to see... Uh, much more action from him. Of course, he featured on the Envy roster prior to uh, to moving up, and Rappel is also a newer addition here uh, to the Houston Outlaws. Yeah, one little fly in the ointment for this matchup compared to the last season. Yada makes no footsteps. Crimson going very aggressive. Both descends extremely low. But uh, Zenyatta makes no footsteps. You can run in at full speed and uh, makes a big difference. This is actually a big deal. Crimzo took a little bit of damage on his base HP, so now Rappel has a bit of a lead, even though they both have shields recharged. Oh, Crimzo is in troubles. Yeah, oh, oh unbelievable. <laughs> what? Oh, he had a sliver of health, but is able to bait Rappel back around the corner and hit him with a right click? That was genuine shock for me. <laughs> that was, uh, yeah. I don't know if that's supposed to happen, but that's what you mean by explosive, right, Jake? Yeah, I mean, it's only a couple headshots with the Discord on to take down the other Zen. So even if you have a bit of a lead, I think Rappel had a chance there, missed a couple shots after that initial strong right click. Um, this is going to be very, very much a chess match, though, I think. There's, the charge fire does reveal your position uh, via the sound cue. So the question is, how much will you actually want to use that charge fire early and how much will you want to save it to punish? 
Trades at range here. Should give Rappel a minor lead. Nothing significant, though, as he doesn't move to the high ground. Yeah, of course. Remember, shields regenerate. Most of Zenyatta's health pool is shield. So just that sort of glancing damage doesn't really matter in the long term, unless you can follow it up. And Crimson just takes the fight to Rappel. Oh, yes. A tactical crouch just to cement dominance. He's already up two to zero. And Rappel, he's, he's shook in chatty types. Holy moly. Did not expect... Uh, the Dilmar dunk. Yeah, that's a nice fearless play from Crimzo right as the Discord decays. Uh, you can see when both Zens have each other discorded, it's very easy to block that line of sight. But uh, because Crimzo has absolutely no fear in his body, he just goes aggro and it totally pays off there. Knows Repel's position to a tease and punishes. So pushing your advantages is very important in this kind of head-to-head -head because that damage you do will eventually be regenerated uh, with Zenyatta's capacity. For, uh, recharging his shield. So if you get an advantage early, if you can sort of feel that out, you can look to follow it up. And Crimzo's giving his position away. Rappel knew he was there. Crimzo took a lot of damage. So did Rappel. Both plays discorded. And Crimzo, he barely charged that right click. Yeah, once again, just baiting Rappel in here. I think Rappel keeps getting the early lead in this matchup, but Crimzo ends up winning out in the long run just by baiting a little bit and passively retreating a little bit. And then as Rappel pushes, that's when he's most vulnerable. Uh, it can be difficult to hit those shots on Zenyatta, on an opponent that's retreating, but an opponent that is pushing into you is your ideal target. So both these players have to be pretty mindful of that. Even if you get the damage lead, you got to be careful. You can just get rolled one shot by that right click, as that's been Crimson's round win every time with that strategy. I mean, the tactical crouch from Rappel got him fired up. He's in chat saying, okay, let's go. No more of that nonsense, but uh, Rappel's starting to run out of rounds. Jakey's margin of error is dwindling swiftly. And we'll see him play from the low ground to start with. Both and the others are aware of approximately where each other are based on these right clicks. Crimzo spot on the high ground. I mean, this is kind of tough for Rappel. Positional advantage makes a big difference in this matchup. And Crimzo's able to keep tabs on Rappel's position by hitting with the Discord wall. Yeah, now it's Crimzo's turn to drop low. Rappel wisely waiting out the right click this time. We'll see if he's able to push his lead. Oh, he's, he is. Crimzo low and Rappel... Jake, I, I was fooled, I'll be honest. It looked like Rappel would actually have lost his whole advantage. You know, he did damage. It's so much so the Crimson had no shield left, and then he waited. And, you know, to an untrained eye, he probably thought he's waiting too long. Uh, Crimson's going to get his health back, but he was actually just waiting the right click, as you pointed out. Yeah, see, that's the crucial difference in this matchup, is it's all about, um, you know, it's, it's not as straightforward, I think, as some other matchups where you can just press a lead and, and close it out pretty consistently, uh, the way a hero like Doomfist can. Uh, or Reinhardt, you know, and it's kind of the exact opposite on Zenyatta. You might have a lead, but you walk into a right click. It doesn't matter how much health you have. You're not going to survive that. Quite fascinating. A lot of nuance here. Three to one is the score. Crimzo still leads, but Rappel, he's fired up. About as fired up as a, a Zen monk can be, which probably isn't a lot. But Rappel, as you can see from his perspective, he knows at least approximately where Crimzo is. Crimson charges a right click and heads to the low ground now. Rappel will maintain the high ground and try and outmaneuver by moving around the balcony. Some voice lines coming out. Crimson takes two hits. Rappel just a Discord Orb. Now he's lost his Discord Orb because Crimson has stayed out of his line of sight for a set period of time. He'll need to reapply that if he wants the damage boost, and that is a filthy right click. Crimson has to run for the hills now. He needs Oof. to get away. There's so much distance between them, so Crimzo can get away safely, but he doesn't regenerate the health that he lost. Just the shields, Jake. And Rappel makes it two to three. Rappel calling out calling his shots there, but the let's go. Now two rounds in a row for the Outlaws. Dallas Field, though, still up three to two. Crimzo could easily bring this back, easily end the series here, but I don't think Rappel wants to let that happen. Rappel wants to send us to five. I'm getting a map pick. Clearly, uh, it's something that the Outlaws do want. And, you know, when we when we actually get to our 6v6, uh, when we find out what maps are chosen, we can take a deeper dive and look at sort of the team successes, respectively, on those maps in the Overwatch League and maybe paint a bigger picture of why they were chosen. All well, the coaches will have a hand in that particular decision. But it's 2-3 to three now. And Crimzo and Rappel will meet on the high ground. Ooh. Quick and dirty. That's what we like to see. I really like that from Rappel. He hides in the corner, but doesn't use the right click. That doesn't expose his position. And Crimzo exactly does use the right click. And when his position's exposed, even though Rappel doesn't have the charge fire, he just lands three quick shots. And that's all he needs to get the kill with, uh, of course, the headshot included in there. 
I don't think I can repeat what Crimzo just said in match chat. Sorry, guys. Let's just say it has, it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a play on words. He used the double yeah. entendre. It's very clever. He, he's, he's feeling the pressure. We can see that. He's certainly <laughs> feeling the pressure. Well, he's had enough time to think about now the impact of his, uh, I wouldn't say unsportsmanlike conduct. He was definitely trying to uh, get in Rappel's head. There was some of his behavior in the first few rounds. But oh, I'll tell you Rappel! what, Rappel is having none of it. Okay, Rappel. Okay. Four in a row now for Rappel. Con of shots. Whew. Crimson is feeling the pressure now. There's no question about that. Note in chat saying, check his mouse. This guy <laughs> just doesn't miss. And now Rappel is one round away from evening the 1v1 series at two apiece and very much keeping Houston in the fight here. How this has changed across the course of this series now. It all feels like after it those like... initial rounds, Crimzo has not had an answer for Rappel's gameplay. I think Rappel has been relying way less on the right clicks, and now is just utilizing that stealth advantage. Crimzo making the same adjustment, though. Neither player charging a right click. No sound. Okay, it's going to be left clicks. Discord orb applied for both. 80 health. 20 health now for Crimzo. He's not going to get all that health back, even if he recharges his shields. So his maximum health points uh, now will stay at 170. Rappel, oh, he's actually got the drop on him there. Couple oars, but Rappel wins it out. What a comeback. It's about as close to a miss. reverse sweep as you're going to get, Jake. He does not miss. That's, oh my, oh my. <laughs> Especially when it all started with him going down 0-3 and then dropping a let's go in chat. That's how you know this player is for real. Crimzo got a little bit ahead of himself there. Rappel clawed all those rounds back see that play of the game a lot of left clicks uh you know i feel like these players evolved in their approach you know a lot of early right clicks a lot of giving away their positions a lot of brash play but then it turned into stealth it turned into only left clicks and uh you know it, you know leading those orbs and securing those headshots became uh the most important part of that matchup mm, and, and in a 1v1 you know it the positional awareness of the other player is is everything right if you know where the enemy player is you know exactly where you need to be on the map. You know everything. That's that's it's a one-on-one -on -one matchup. You've got all the info um, if you can get their location. So I think using that right click uh, is very very risky, very expensive. Crimzo made it work early in the round, but I think once Repel made the adjustment to dodge those charge right clicks and, and just outlast Crimzo into the fight, then Crimzo did not have the answers. It seemed in that like raw aim duel left clicks at close range. That's where Repel was just so sharp with the headshots. Really impressive stuff. Nice. And as you said, as close to a reverse sweep as you can get. You love to see it. That means that will necessitate a fifth map in our 1v1 series. And uh, there's no better way to end it, of course. It'll be two gunslingers. It'll be Linksa going up against Zachary on the McCree in a best of nine 1v1. And that will decide which of these two teams will get to choose the first map in our 6v6 battle for Texas on the 18th. So plenty of lean up time into that but already these teams are vying for the opportunity to select their map and uh yeah that's going to be a lot of fun we still have a little bit more to be decided in this 1v1 series before we move on to the 3v3 so ladies and gentlemen i hope you stick with us as we go to a quick break and on the other side of these messages we get our map five we get our gunslinger our rootin tootin showdown between linksa and zachary stick with us
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the Lone Star Showdown presented by Samsung. And if you're just joining us, you've come at just the right time. We are heading into map five of our 1v1 challenges. The winner will decide the first map of the 6v6 Battle for Texas happening in a couple of weeks' time. But Jake, uh, let us give everyone a bit of a recap of what we just saw and uh, what better way to do that than uh, to duck back into the Repel versus Crimson matchup in our play of the match presented by Favor and HEB. Yeah, wow, what a huge pickup by Repel to bring this series back from down 3-0. Five straight rounds for Rappel. I heard in the game in the in the game chat that when Rappel dropped down 3-0, he said that everyone was yelling at him, and then he said, "Please be quiet." And I guess we see why he needs the silence. Five consecutive kills on the enemies of the Yagata. Really nice headshots from Rappel. It's nice to see the Rappel's role playing. You know, he's really in character. The Omnic Monk requires tranquility in order to do his best work, but. Uh, Look, I'll be honest, Crimson dropped the tactical crouch. He was trying to flex on Rappel. And, uh, you know, I guess he who laughs last, laughs loudest. It's time now to jump into our fifth map. It is a McCree showdown between Hotshots, Linksa, and Zachary. Jake, what are we looking for here as we head into Castillo? This is the one one we've been waiting for. This is going to be pretty much all about headshots on a map like Castillo. It's so difficult to close range. Uh, you can close range, of course, the flashing is almost a guaranteed instant kill, but this is going to be decided by the long range trading, I expect. Zachary on screen gets a lot of early damage and finds a headshot. If he doesn't headshot Linksa as that flash comes out, he may die. He would have been stunned and would have been right clicked down. That definitely makes all the difference in the world getting that pick just before flat, but that's just the knife edge that a pre 1v1 rests on. Uh, those headshots, you know, you can boot tap an enemy recovery, headshot, body shot, uh, or two shots if you just want to flex. Uh, of course, you can do that even within the flash ping, so incredibly rare um, to see the duels turn around, but it's possible. Again, hitting those flashbangs not easy to do. It requires the enemy McCree to come rather close to you. A lot of these battles happen at sort of medium to long range, and this sort of square that you're seeing links to look over the top of is about McCree's ideal range. Look at him get that early damage on Zachary. Both are low though. Zachary's one shot. Links are now is two. Ooh, nice turnaround by Zach. Moves up just a little bit into the range. He can still do full damage, no damage fall off, and that keeps him in the round, allows him to come back. Links are down to two here. And that was a very aggressive push by Zachary, just right down mid at the start of the round. Pretty rare strategy to see on Castillo. Drake, when you play McCree, how cognizant are you of, of your damage fall off and the range at which that begins to occur? Is it just sort of something you observe or is it something you actually play around on purpose? Fight. I think it has to be a, a question of feel, right? You don't have the time to really uh, consciously think about it, you know, strategize around it. It's just a question of feel. You have to get a sense for, you know, when you're going to deal that full damage, when you're at the effective range and whether it matters or not. Linkster has a big lead here, but a headshot could turn it all around. Okay, Zachary was able to find one shot. You'll notice that both of these McCrees are doing a lot of strafing. It's, a, it's not easy to hit uh, an enemy McCree when he's moving left to right. And again, I think many maybe consider sort of heroes like McCree or Widowmaker the ultimate uh, aim heroes in this game. Of course, Ash is also his scanner provides that. Do you ever, if you ever play against a McCree, Jake, do you, do you ever feel like you, you try and beeline for them and sort of test them? You know, is there sort of a, an ego or pride challenge? I mean, I, I don't know what I'm asking you. You killed your ego years ago, but do you ever feel like you want to, you know, go after the McCree on the other side of the map and show him his boss? McCree definitely is a bit of an ego duel. It, it's so critical to take down the other McCree, give yourself the freedom to pick off other players. So this duel is a very realistic one that we see all the time. Uh, when these heroes match up against each All other, right, there. Jake, well, um, just gonna... it's so explosive, right? You can just pick them off so quickly. And McCree also has a pretty large hitbox, so they're both ideal targets for Jake is going to restart his stream quickly. And uh, while he does that, I will take the next round. So you'll be devoid of uh, those uh, cutting insights for the time being, but he will return in just a moment. And there's a 2v2 here. Lynx was able to find those rounds back. And Castillo is an interesting map. Do you choose the high ground or the low? Do you fight around the statue? A lot of ways to break line of sight or otherwise occlude yourself from view and we're going to roll out with links this round who opts immediately to take the high ground and again takes huge damage early zachary was all over that one found the first couple of shots it looks like it was a headshot to finish a 180 little spin and he's done with that three to two now 
favoring Zachary. And again, the winner of this match will be choosing the first map when we get to our 6v6 battle for Texas. Of course, uh, we recently saw these two teams go head to head in the Overwatch League and actually gave us one of the most exciting matches we've seen in quite some time. It ended three to two in favor of the Dallas Fuel. So getting a replay of that with even more on the line, I guess you could say, just because there's so much bragging rights and you know, obviously the, the trophy. And Samsung has made sure along with their other sponsors that, uh, you know, there is something to play for here. No doubt about it. Leaks it down to 64, takes another hit. He was at 10. He's able to find Zachary and now we're even at three rounds apiece. And we'll give Jake some time to get back in. And yeah, get his stuff reset. Jake lives in a gaming house, so there are a lot of streamers there. You can respect that. But so far, it's been these two players mostly opting to take the high ground. I guess no one really wants to get left on the low ground and be forced to have to play an angle. It's a little bit of an uncomfortable shot to make. And I mean, realistically, you can see less of the enemy than they can of you if you have to aim at that angle. That's just how optics works, fam. Trust me. Wow, even from spawn. So you can see that damage fall off actually really, uh, really showing there. Not a ton of damage that they have ranged. A couple love taps, but Zachary now makes it four to three. And now he is one step away from securing Dallas's map selection in the Battle of Texas. Well, not really much flashbang now. And after that first round, links it in chat saying that he believes he's the cleaner McCree. Zachary telling him that he's got flushed. And he's asking where Lynx is hiding. Fight. Match now we go once more. Stick around after this as well. We'll be heading into our 3v3 team challenges. So uh, uh, we'll see how different combinations of heroes and players uh, carry their teams to victory. But Zachary has done it comes out with the W here, and that means that the Dallas Fuel will get to choose map one when we get to our Battle for Texas on May the 18th. And uh, this is a, a fun part here where I get to break down a little bit what we see. We get to see the play of the game here from Linksa. You can see just how hard it is to uh, connect from long range. These two are playing outside of McCree's optimal range there. So it takes more shots, but perhaps it's a bit more safer in that regard. You take one hit. And maybe you're not uh, too stressed about it. Hello! I'm on full screen right now as Jake works on getting back in. Don't you worry, though. After the break, he will uh, be back with us. And we'll have a chance to uh, discuss a little bit what we saw in our 1v1s. Uh, of course, uh, later on today, our, our 3v3s. And also next week, you'll be able to see more 1v1s. So everybody on these rosters is going to get a chance to showcase their, their talents and, and their abilities over different heroes. So... Fear not, if you miss some of these, you can go back and check the VOD or on YouTube. So you can just rewind and there will be another chapter to the 1v1 story next week as these teams continue to fight for their choice in maps. It's been a pleasure to have you with us so far, ladies and gentlemen. That means that we're gonna, gonna be heading into our 3v3 challenges quite shortly. We do hope you stick around for that one and bear with us now as we get Jake back into the lobby. In the meantime, of course, uh, you know, if you are local, uh, you know, in the Texas area, you will be able to see what map these teams chose after, you know, well, after, well Dallas chose, of course, after winning this series and the winner of our 3v3. And if you're local, you can even watch that over on television. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of fun. It's nice to get some Overwatch here on television. We're going to be back, ladies and gentlemen, with the rest of our show. We're going to head into our 3v3 challenges now between the Dallas Fuel and the Houston Outlaws. The winner will get to choose map number two for the Battle of Texas in two weeks' time.
Yeah, he sets my body in motion. He just, he knows how to turn things up. And he knows what gets me going. Yeah, like a little text saying, hey, what's up? They look at me, I'm in a bad situation. Look at him, he's got a bad reputation. They be looking at us. Think of me at too much. Look at me, I'm in a bad situation. Look at him, he's got a bad reputation. They be looking at us. Be good, good. I'm a Yeah, he sets my body in motion He just, he knows how to turn things up And he knows what gets me going Yeah, like, a little text saying, hey, what's up? They look at me, I'm in a bad situation Look at him, he's got a bad reputation They be looking at us, thinking we are too much Look at me, I'm in a bad situation Look at him, he's got a bad reputation They be looking at us, mm -hmm. They look at me, I'm in a bad situation Look at him, he's got a bad reputation They be looking at us Think of me at too much Look at me, I'm in a bad situation Look at him, he's got a bad reputation They be looking at us Be good, good. I'm a Jack Links, proud to be the official protein snack of Team Envy and the Dallas Fuel. Jack Links, feed the old wild side. Shop online or through the HEB app to purchase your groceries today. Here, everything's better.
The Houston Outlaws and the Dallas Fuel wish to thank Samsung for presenting the 2020 Lone Star Showdown. Follow us over the next three weeks to see who is named the top Overwatch team in Texas. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Lone Star Showdown presented by Samsung. Thank you for bearing with us during our brief break. We have managed to, well, retrieve Jake from the uh, the deepest, darkest corners of the interweb and he is, is back with us now. And uh, Jake, we had a chance to uh, talk a little bit at the start of that McCree 1v1 as we head into our 3v3s. Any uh, closing thoughts about that Linksa Zachary head-to-head -head before we leave that one behind? <laughs> I'm just not just saying, right? McCree is such a close match. It is all about the one halves, all about the headshots, getting that HP lead, and then uh, playing it out. Uh, both strong McCree players. It's nice to see them a little bit back in action. Both players have been taking a bit of a backseat to their other teammates so far in the Overwatch League, uh, at least this season. So it's good to see them out there again. And of course, so um, has the McCree, I guess, with hero pools in the Overwatch League, seeing McCree out of rotation this last week and uh, essentially unable to be picked right now. So let's have a recap. We just saw the Outlaws and the Fuel go head to head in a series of 1v1s and it came all the way down to the wire. If we thought it would be over after, uh, you know, map number two, the Outlaws uh, were already down zero to two, but then we saw them claw it back. And of course, Repel in the 1v1 Zenyatta matchup was a big part of it. Blase, of course, on the Doomfist winning out against Doha. And then we managed to see uh, Zachary overcome Linksa to secure things so it was back and forth and quite exciting you know we get i feel like Jake, we get just enough 1v1 right like there is a degree i remember watching i remember you know casting 1v1 tournaments way back in the day and like it, it can go on quite a lot and there's only so much to talk about but here i feel like we got just the perfect amount uh you know of uh, 1v1s and enough opportunity to dive in but this is a reminder of our format ladies and gentlemen so best of five series each map is a best of five rounds uh, this is for the 3v3, mind you. We had best of nine for the 1v1. Now it's best of five. So coaches submit a roster before each matches and it's required that each team has a DPS, a tank and a support player. And remember the winner of this series of 3v3 matches will be awarded a map choice for map two in week three's Lone Star Showdown, the battle for Texas. So Jake, let us discuss uh, as we head into Necropolis, 3v3 compositions. How read up are you on this? Now, you're very well read on a majority of topics, uh, but what about 3v3s and the compositions we should expect to see in 3v3 Overwatch? Well, I haven't played too much 3-on-3 three three personally or seen too much of it played, but I think I would guess we'll see uh, mostly like a half of a traditional composition. Like you'll play dive with, you know, a wrecking ball, a tracer and an Ana or something like that, right? You just like... Or, or, you know, you could play a defensive comp with like a, a Sigma, a McCree, and an Ana or a Zenyatta. You know, like I think you're really just going to cut a traditional comp in half and just pick three heroes that work together. I'd expect to see Fast Dive actually work pretty well, but ooh, I'm pretty excited to see what Outlaws are fielding here. This is a very strong defensive composition. Uh oh, looks like Dallas has made a bit of an error right. here, actually. Pick picking yeah, two teams. Okay. Uh, well... <laughs> This is a rule yeah, violation. That's right. they, they, I, think, I think we're going to have to sack around here. I don't know if they here. will be penalized. Yes, okay. So we will actually get to see the lobby uh, reset here. or It just resets the game really quickly. So there is a chance now for the Fuel to correctly choose one support, one DPS, and one tank. I don't blame Doha and Node for trying to choose uh, the most robust heroes with the largest health pools, but uh, that ain't the rules. And now as we go back into round one, I mean, that Torbjorn composition was nasty. Torb, Ana, and Orisa. What is this comp supposed to do? Oh, this is bad faith from Dallas Fuel. Seeing the enemy team composition and then hard counter picking it. I don't know about do you this, call this Dallas. A you call this a hard counter? <laughs> That's a little With questionable. <laughs> yeah, they picked Bastion in a Torb. <laughs> That's a really, really strong counter. So now Outlaws have to make some sort of crazy play Remember. to come back. This is a really hard match to win because Torb is just never going to be able to out damage a Bastion. And it's going to be all about the shield Oh dear, trade. he had to use Biotic Grenade on himself, which means less healing for the rest of his team. That was a halt thrown out there by Note. And Doha almost gobbled him up. Jake just wants to let him know that's a bad faith kick. But they're taking the low ground, the fuel. Doha can repair himself, an important facet of uh, the Bastion. And Immortality Field has already been used by Crimzo now. 
Now remember, as time ticks down, these teams will still have to fight over a point in the middle of the map. Choose by a nade. Chase down the stairs. The outlaws hold the high ground and Fuel just pushing in recklessly. I think that was a big mistake there, trying to come in on the low ground. And now blase has got the handler out and he's finishing <laughs> off. I, I don't know how outlaws managed to win that with the, with their comp. Pretty much hard counter. It's so Fuel, they've got to be feeling the I pressure mean, after that Bastion, one. I mean, one of his biggest strengths is that he can obviously heal himself back up. But when Raucus hits a huge biotic grenade... Doha has nothing to do but run away. He can't heal. He gets halted by hydration. And, and then he's just subject to Torbjorn's damage as Blase runs him down. So, you know, the composition, I guess, that uh, Houston were playing allowed them to really uh, turn up the heat. Now we have different comps here. So remember, if you win a round, you cannot use those heroes again. Because the fuel lost, they can go for this similar comp again. This time without the Batiste, though. You're covered. Once again, Outlaws get control of this crucial high ground. And now it's actually Rockets' turn to be on the DPS playing Soldier 76. We'll see how well this works out for them. They're going to have to be elusive. If the Bastion catches anybody, it should be an easy kill, but not Roadhog. <laughs> That's the one that composition is so much healing. Rockets and Hydration heal themselves. In fact, Brigitte is the actual support, and she does far less self healing than the other two, respectively. Now, there is no shield uh, for the Outlaws to hide behind. They have to try and somehow break no shield while avoiding the, this damage out from Doha. Holt. Does catch Blase briefly, but he's able to stave off most of that damage. And again, you can I feel like they can punish uh, Jake the Outlaw's composition when they have to move to the point. When they force him to rotate, that's when they can sort of find an advantage. Yeah, I think this is going to come down to the point contest uh, almost certainly here. But this is a great split now. Hydration taking a ton of map control off of the flank. We'll see if Fuel are ready for it. If they can sleep this guy, it'll be an easy kill, though. So Hydration, got to watch his of course, can have his healing turned off by the bio grenade from Krunzo. So he needs to be very careful. So the capture area will be unlocking in 30 seconds. Both teams will have to step down and fight around that. That's where it gets a little bit more interesting, especially with the huge pit in the middle of the map. That's where that Orisa can really make a difference. As can the Roadhog. Hydration might be trying to bait something here. He's going to back away. He's body grenaded. He's done. Chased down and there's a nano boost. That's how long the round's gone for. Now some of these ultimates are starting to become slightly more relevant. Only two players left and there's no real help for remaining. Raucus going for the tactical visor here. Crimzo so low, peaked out for just a second and got taken down. He slept on the though. point. Slept on the point. Note comes up from behind now. Blase try to heal Raucus up, but it's just Blase now, Jake. And Doha is in cannon form. And Blase couldn't step onto the point. Uh, the hydration getting picked off there made all the difference in the world. Even Crimzo missed his sleep on the halt, but still, hydration just gets chased out. Nowhere for him to run when he's in that pit. Nice, nice strategy from the Outlaws. They have to make it work without the Orisa, and it's a tough matchup to win. They almost made it happen. Rockets nearly got the cap while asleep, but no, it was just there in time. Wonder what comps we'll see come out now that neither team has access to the Orisa anymore. What? Genji, Fight. Lucio, and Winston. Full dive. Full dive, and uh, again, we'll still see the Brigitte and the Roadhog here. So, do you, don't, do you feel like the Outlaws have the edge in this composition based on having the Hog to deal with the Winston? Oh, yeah. How do you kill a Brig or a Roadhog with these heroes? I mean, Hydration knows he can get booted off the map. That's pretty much the main Not risk. Though. But, oh, Hydration drops. Don't so low, Don't want to get away. Raucus is down, though. Blase is also following, and this anti dive composition might just fall here. Hydration is low, but his foes are too. Knocked off the map, and that'll get the job done. Nicely done by Crimzo to set up that boop. And the dive composition wins. They managed to deal with the Roadhog, I guess. They don't yeah. need to damage him down if they can knock him off the map, Jake. Yeah, the team got separated. That was the key, right? Rockus and Blase falling first. Hydration can't win the three-on-one. I think Outlaws needed to just stay tight there, stay close together. Uh, as soon as they split up like that, it just created an issue, a circumstance where the dive can pick them apart, take down the weakest hero first. And that's the opposite of what you want if you're the Outlaws. You want to work together with your Brigida. Uh oh, this looks uh, much worse, I think, for the Outlaws. Farah shouldn't have too much trouble. Only a Soldier 76 effectively uh, putting out the damage. So Rockus has his work cut out for him because Doha is going to be pretty much permanently pocketed. And when Note comes in for the slam, Doha, it should be an easy kill. Known for his far. He's freakishly good on this pick. And we'll see now, rolling around the corner is Note to the high ground. Knox Hydration up, trying to focus down the Rogue Hulk early on. He's going to take a breather and back away. Now Doha has the advantage of being on the outside, being able to peek into this close quarters area, this stairwell, and get free damage done. Note gets accosted briefly by Raucus, but's able to back away. And now in the sky, the hook catches Doha. He takes a lot of damage, but he's able to get away with a concussive blast. Note now comes on down with the pile driver. 
And these teams, for a brief moment, disengage. Ooh, both teams trading. Crimson's the target, it seems, for all the poke damage coming out from the Alvaz. They really want to get this Mercy down. Reduce the difficulty that they're going to take out. But Torah gets completely oh, just takes a huge hit from the Roadhog. And then the splashback from his own rocket actually ends up killing him. This composition looked really good on paper. Jake, full of fuel, but now note has to go it alone. He doesn't have any healing left. Yes, he'll have a shield available every now and then, but I really don't see what he can do from here, especially now. Look at how safe the rest of the outlaws are playing, knowing that there's environmental kill potential still from note. Hydration's just gonna wait on the point. He could win this 1v1. He's got two teammates to help him. Pretty much no hope for note here. Yeah, 3v1 is not something too winnable. <laughs> Harsher in the chat says, sorry, Dallas, we have the Brigitte Specialist. And yes, for those that remember last year, Blase spent much of his time. He's a DPS player. He spent much of his time playing Brigitte and D.Va respectively. They were not his preferred picks, but, uh, you know, credit to the guy. He still ground them out and learned how to play him. Jake, you were the uh, designated Brig player for the Outlaws for a while. One. Uh, that's a time I, I don't miss, but now ooh, I like the composition coming out from the Outlaws. Same thing that Fuel ran before, except with the Reinhardt this time. Uh, Laze on the Bastion. Gonna have a pretty easy time, I would imagine, here. Uh, we'll see, though, because Outlaws with the same composition were able to bring the Orisa comp pretty close. Uh, we'll see how this one breaks down. I think this is gonna be pretty much a grind for ultimates. I don't expect either team to get uh, any free I mean, It's so tough here. for Soldier 76 Doha to try and break this shield. Uh, you know, Hydration's going to be saving that for as long as he can. And God, I mean, we might get to a point where ultimates become relevant and then that Earth Shatter becomes extra scary. Amp Matrix and the Bastion as well. Raucus and Blase can combo with their ultimates for some horrifying results. But Jay, Note is trying to flank from the backside here, but he may have missed his chance. But nice work by the Outlaws, totally punishing Note's flank. Note's finally showing up. Looks Blase, but no hope for a kill there. Raucus has the Immortality field. Prepped and ready, now moving to point. And once you lose a player in the three on three, things are looking extremely bad for you. Roadhog turns it around, but it costs him his life and still a two on one here. How does Doha ever break the shield? I feel that the Outlaws players can pretty much just sit on point, get that immortality field cooldown back up, potentially use the amp matrix, but just don't take any risks here for the Outlaws. Play together. Don't give Doha a chance to pick up rockets. That's what Doha needs to do, is somehow find a way to get this Batiste Well, down. Helix Rocket may help, and well, in fairness, the Outlaws have put themselves in a fairly close quarter scenario here, but they're not going to give anything up for free. Eventually, Hydration and Raucus will be able to move to the point, and Doha will be forced to try and make something happen. Look at him trying to get past the Reinhardt shield, but immediately, Immortality Field is forced out, and that is a cute fire strike that will catch and that'll do it. The Houston Outlaws are going to win the first of our 3v3s, showcasing a series of different compositions, Jake. Which one of those really did it for you? Uh, honestly, I think that, that Brig Hog Soldier was really interesting. The triple self heal, right? All those heroes have a ton of self sustain. It didn't always get the win, but I just thought the composition is good for a three on three situation. It's a comp that you'll pretty much never see in a six on six but in a three-on-three -three environment is exactly what you want, right? Three self-sustaining heroes uh, that can keep them, keep their teammates up, that can just be really, really durable, really, really annoying to deal with. And we saw those comps even do pretty well against Bastion comps, although- Now, do you feel like the Dallas Fuel threw away a golden opportunity when they had the Fara Mercy and the Wrecking Ball composition? Because it sounded like you expected that to be incredibly effective uh, against what the Outlaws had on that particular round. Uh, well, the Outlaws made a great reactionary play to move into the house where Farah struggles the most. There was definitely a moment there where Rockets dodged a couple Rockets that, had they connected from Doha, certainly would have been the kill on Soldier. And once Soldier dies in that matchup, there's pretty much no hope for killing the Farah Mercy. They're just going to play in the Skybox, super long range. Roadhog really can't deal with that play. Uh, neither can Brigida. So props to Rock is doing a great job surviving the dive. And once he does that, then the matchup becomes a lot easier. And of course, big shout out to Jack Lynx. A proud protein partner of the Dallas Fuel. There you go, an alliteration for you thrown into that region. We all love protein. So, uh, big shout out to them. Make some darn good jerky. And now, though, coming up, we still have more of these 3v3s to go. And next map is going to be Castillo. So, a little bit of a different landscape. But do you still expect to see them sort of rotate through these compositions, Jake? It seems like we, we got to see, uh, especially when it has to be one DPS, one tank, one support. It seems like we got to see most of the most robust uh, setups with those heroes. 
Yeah, I still think Orisa is um, probably the strongest possible hero in this mode. The halt is just so devastating. Uh, when the enemy team can't field multiple tanks, it's really consistent to halt somebody in for a kill. Uh, and the shield, of course, is great in a three-on-three -three environment, just sustaining and denying the enemy ult charge. Um, so I expect to see that hero be dominant, but of course, if you win one round, you've got to stop running it. Um, I think for me, the difference makers are going to be when a team can take an, a disadvantage comp and still somehow come out on top. Like we saw uh, Houston somehow defeating a Bastion comp with a Torp comp, uh, which really shouldn't <laughs> happen, I think. I think that's definitely uh, fuels missteps that led to that. But that allows Houston to come out on top in the, in the series in the end. You know, it didn't seem as impactful in the beginning, but... How much nuance wins, is there wins. to this, Jake? Like, let me pose you a situation. You want to play a really powerful tank, right, Orisa. Now you're expecting to win the round and you know you won't be able to select Orisa or any of the other accompanying heroes after that. So do you choose Orisa plus a DPS and a support that maybe aren't as strong? You know, you try and go for a strong composition on average, but make sure that you still have really powerful DPSs and supports to choose if you were to win that round? Well, I think the most important thing in the three on three, more so than a hero being powerful, is just that it fits okay. in the theme of your strategy. You know, like this hero like Soldier 76 isn't really thought of as a very powerful hero, but you put him in with a Brigitte and a Roadhog uh, in a comp that's all about self-sustain, um, self-heal that allows the three on three comp to actually split up, which is pretty rare. Most three on three comps are gonna need to stick together all the time. Um, but when you run the Soldier, the Brig and the Roadhog, they can split up a little bit. It makes for a unique comp and it has a, it has a key theme, a key strategy. Um, that, that you know makes up the whole point of the comp, like the reason you're playing it. So I think um, to keep to stick with those themes is the most important thing when you're running a three on three. You have to have a, a holistic composition that has a game now, plan to make. As we go into that, uh, we'll be looking for those themes as these teams continue to, to craft these three v three compositions in order to get the upper hand. We have a roster change here on the side of the Dallas Fuel. They're going to bring in Closer, Decay, and Gamsu. One advantage this composition has is that they could all just switch to Korean and, and don't sort of need to communicate in uh, in any sort of, uh, you know, English language or something similar. But also, I mean, you know, Gamsu now gets a good crack uh, going against Hydration in that tank position. Closer, uh, obviously the support player for the Dallas Fuel. We, we see a lot of uh, his, uh, you know, his Lucio play and, uh, and Decay, one of the newest additions uh, coming over from of course, the Los Angeles Gladiators, big impact in the Dallas Fuel, big reason why they're starting to perform. No changes on the Outlaw side though. So Blase, Raucus and Hydration is still the setup that they want to go with. And in moments, we'll be heading into Castillo and we'll see if the Dallas Fuel's changing composition will change their fortunes or maybe even change the way they want to play. Maybe we see some different compositions from them, uh, which is basically, uh, if you haven't cottoned on yet, the main thing that we're looking for from these teams. I think this choice to bring in Gomsu especially makes a lot of sense. I think uh, main tanks are the dominant choice here over off tanks. Uh, heroes like D.Va, they want to be playing behind another hero. They want to be that secondary front line, not the first initiator. Um, so, you know, those main tanks are going to dominate and Gomsu, main tank player, that's exactly what you want. Even Hydration, it actually makes sense to have him in. Um, not only does he play heroes like Roadhog to a very high level, um, but when he does play tank, it is usually on a more main tank center role. Like, you know, you're going to run a Hammond. Um, or an Orisa or something like that. So I think uh, Hydration, also a good player for this matchup. I expect to see the tank duel be especially impactful in the three on three. Uh, if one tank falls, pretty much game over in the three on three. You know, that player advantage is so much more significant. And one player pick in the six on six is a big deal. In a three on three, it's many times more important. So. Uh, it's all about trading those initial finals. Well, blows. you heard it. And now as we head into Castillo, it's a little bit different to Necropolis. You'll see that there is uh, a cliff ledge. So there is potential for environmental kills, but they're harder to achieve in some senses than, uh, you know, on a map like Necropolis, where there's a pit in the middle of the map. So these teams will play around the center. We have Echo here from Decay. It's going to be Echo, Mercy, and the Wrecking Ball, Jake. It's going to be tough for Decay, though. Torb is a pretty strong answer to this um, Mercy and Echo. They're going to have to break the Torb turret, and that's going to be mostly on Gamsu, disrupting the shield setup. But if Rockus finds the sleeve, Gamsu could be so in trouble. All eyes on Gamsu. He needs to displace the Outlaws from the high ground. They have a very well-entrenched position, and frankly, Echo doesn't do that much to shields outside of the Sticky Bombs. I mean, a try shot does damage, but look, okay, there's the displacement, and look at this. Immediately, Decay responds, comes over the top. There's a lot of early damage on Raucus. But that's it. Just, just barely survives, and he doesn't have his biotic grenade cooldown, so it's going to be a while before Rockets can get back into the fight. Fortunately, points not available, so 
I like this play from Outlaws. They just need to regroup and get their HP back on this Ana. He's such a vulnerable target. Both are closing in on a Valkyrie as well. Absolutely. That could be devastating. I mean, have no map. Having the opportunity to resurrect on a 3v3 is uh, going to be tremendous. Gansu is hit by the Hulk and is slept, but he'll be healed up pretty easily after that. Valkyrie's online here for closer. Now, what do the Outlaws do? How do they get out of this room? Now that the point is unlocking in 30 seconds. Rockus is their only healing, so he waited to self-heal himself and have the Bada Grenade ready once again. Now baiting the dive of the Outlaws, and I think this is a bit over-aggressive from the fuel. Nano comes out on the Torv and... They force the Nano Boost at least uh, on towards Blase, and Decay manages to find Rockus with the Sticky Bombs now the 3v2. No Mercy on the side of the Outlaws, no Resurrection opportunity, but Decay goes down. Hydration managed to catch him, can close to get a Resurrect. He dives in, he gives up his life for it, but he brings Decay back, and now with Hydration down, Blase only had a sliver of health left. And now that composition will be unavailable for the fuel, but you can see it hits hard. Select your yeah, that first dive was so significant. Rock has barely survived, but he had to wait three cooldown cycles in the Biotic Grenade to heal himself up, showing how important healing is in this mode. Ana's only way to heal herself is the Biotic Grenade, and that cooldown is not a, not a quick one at all. So really, I think that cost Outlaws so much in terms of map position that pushing out of that room was pretty much a death sentence. All right, in we go. Doomfist, Ana, and the Zarya. And on the high ground now. Doomfist could be really deadly here. He's gonna get every single bubble from Zarya, but Bastion can carve him up very, very quickly. Decay so tries to go in. Zarya bubble popped almost immediately into K. Sails on by Blase, makes an easy target of himself. Now moving across the high ground. I, I mean, with no DPS left, I mean, closer and Gamsu. It's a Zarya and an Ana. Not a lot of damage there. Gamsu's bubbles are probably gonna pop pretty quickly, and yeah, Gamsu realizes that this one is over. I like this draft from uh, Fuel. I think it's uh, a pretty intelligent one. You know, the Doom with the uh, Zarya makes a lot of sense thematically, but <laughs> in Bastion, there's not much you can do in that matchup. Well, one apiece now. And uh, the Bastion is off the table there. So Blase, Raucus, and Hydration managed to get themselves around back, but in doing so, uh, render those heroes unselectable. So again, the, the more even the score, generally the more even the hero pools available for these two rosters. Hydration rolls up, so it's going to be Moira, Symmetra. Symmetra, and Reinhardt. Rock is going to have his work cut out for him trying to survive. They are going to run down Rockus if they don't catch him here. But, ooh, Rockus gets the kill on Decay. What an important headshot. There. Charge forward from Gamsu off the map. Yep, well, he knew it was over pretty much midway through that. Sombra. Okay. Big shutdowns there. And, I mean, Closer wasn't able to do too much as Blase was able to mess him up. Once the fade cooldown wasn't available, he was an easy target. We're even with all of that healing, it's two to one in favor of the Outlaws. Yeah, Moira is a hero that thrives on a group of your teammates. You want as many teammates as possible. So I actually think in a three on three, Moira is at her weakest, only able to cleave two targets at maximum with the heal, which really reduces the effectiveness of the hero overall that is all about cleaving. Now a more classic rush comp coming in for fuel. Not so much heals, but a lot of damage and Decay setting up on the flank, trying to catch Rockus. Looks like that's not gonna happen though. Decay is at least able to get up to the high ground with teleport. And you can see the fuel really want to take the fight to the Outlaws right now. And the Outlaws don't have a speed boost uh, like the fuel do. So Closer is allowing the fuel to close the gap a little more. Bardic fuel had to be put down by Raucus. That was actually to heal his, uh, his other two players. As he continues to rotate around. Oddly enough, I mean, this Outlaws composition wants to brawl too, Jake. But right now, they're really avoiding a fight. No, I think this is very intelligent from them. They have a massive ad advantage in range damage. Uh, this Lucio is pretty much the only spam available for the fuel, whereas you've got Soldier and Roadhog both do a pretty significant amount of damage at range. So I think the fuel might need to wait this one out, wait for the point to open and force that close range contest, maybe bait the Roadhog in. But Outlaw is just going to have essentially free poke here. Pretty unlikely that they're going to be able to get caught on a map like Castillo, where it's so easy to see the enemy team coming on this high ground. Hydration playing from a flanking position now. Raucus acting as the other side of the pincer. And in moments, we'll see that uh, capture area unlock and decay. He is creeping. He is sneaking. He's right below Hydration right now and trying to wrap around the side. Trying to get the drop on him, but Hydration spots him and now he has to retreat. But this is where things start to get interesting, Jake. Now these two teams are gonna actually have to brawl. They need to commit and fight over the center of the map. 
Yeah, it's going to be all about the point control here. I think this is wise from the field. They need to force Hydration to contest point and get the kill on that Roadhog. But that means Rockus is going to have absolute free shooting here on point. He's sitting on the flank trying to grind down that run. First. Hydration had the challenge. No choice. Looked like it would go either way there. They got off the point. Oh, they got a point. Have we just seen a C9 in a 3v3? That's a scene. <laughs> oh no, no, no. Decay dropped. That is a definition of a C9. Nice boot by Closer to secure it. But wow, yeah, Outlaws had that locked up if they just don't C9. That's pretty much the only way they could lose, and they did. So, yeah, that's an Overwatch classic right here in the three on three. People don't normally uh, expect in 3v3 how quickly the point can be captured. It is fast. You have to jump down awfully quick. I don't think the Outlaws were ready for it, which is why they frantically dropped down and started fighting. They actually got an advantage. They got rid of the, the Reaper to start with. But now, I mean, this is it. It's 2v2, both teams saving the Orisas for the final round. But Decay takes down Blase. Immortality Field goes a long way for Closer. Hydration has to step forward now. They comes to a sleeping huge body grenade, but they're still cut down. And the Dallas Fuel are gonna take away our second 3v3, evening up this best of five series. And now, of course, the option to choose the second map of our final showdown in two weeks hangs in the balance. That's how the Bastion versus Torb matchup is supposed to go. Pretty much impossible for Torb. So if you'll play that a lot cleaner, able to just uh, reset time and time again, and Torb just doesn't have the damage to keep up in the shield. And we saw the way that Houston tried to bring it back was to sleep the Orisa, step forward of the shield and throw a biotic grenade to the ground to try and work down the Bastion that didn't have any healing, but there was still backline pressure. There was still damage available for Dallas to turn that fight around. The 3v3s have been interesting so far. A few different compositions. It looked like a bit of strategy this time around as we saw both teams save that Orisa-based composition for as late as possible till that decider around. Mm, definitely. I think it's going to be interesting to see as the series goes on how these teams develop because no one has that much experience playing in these three-on-three -three matches. So uh, your ability to pick the right compositions and have a wide range to choose from makes well, a big difference. This series of 3v3s is tied at one apiece. We've still got much more to come on the other side of these messages. Lone Star Showdown, presented by Samsung. Always gaming, always Texas. Stay connected and stay gaming with the Samsung Galaxy S20 Ultra 5G. Jack Lynx, proud to be the official protein snack of Team Envy and the Dallas Fuel. Jack Lynx, feed your wild side. From your favorite Texas restaurants to everyday essentials, get anything you want delivered fast with favor. Be one of the first 500 new users to apply the code FUEL10 for $10 off your first order. Restrictions apply. Visit favordelivery.com forward slash promos for details. Favor, anything delivered. In life, you either eat the protein of Jack Link's steaks made with 100% beef, and you run with Sasquatch, or you run from Sasquatch.
Bye. Um, play overall 16 hours per day. I've had a lot of issues with my eyes in the past. The more I play, the more tired my eyes get. They showed us a presentation on how blue light filters work, how it can help your eyes, your health, your performance. With Zenith glasses, they feel more natural part of your style or your fashion. With these glasses specifically, it's very hard to tell a difference. So I think every gamer can actually benefit from them. It'll help your eyes without taking away from the gameplay. Hello everybody and thanks for staying with us during the break. This is the Lone Star Showdown and we're into the 3v3 portion of our preliminary rounds. It is one apiece between the Dallas Fuel and the Houston Outlaws and much like they have in the Overwatch League, Jake, these two teams are keeping it close. Yeah, extremely close. I mean, we even saw a C9 come in there fully uh, emulating occasional <laughs> events in the Overwatch League. Now we get to see more of both teams' rosters as they both make some pretty interesting adjustments uh, going into this next round of the three-on-three. -three. Yes, that's right. Eco Point Antarctica is going to be our next map. Again, a different map brings different possibilities for compositions, but I think we've seen quite a few robust ones so far. Of course, uh, a big shout out to Favor for uh, being a sponsor and helping make this happen. Texas favorites delivered fast. And uh, yes, these two teams are, again, still fighting for the opportunity to select a map in the Battle of Texas. So essentially, the first two weeks of play are centered around these two teams, showing their skills in 1v1s and 3v3s, allowing them to choose maps, uh, you know, when we actually get to that final battle. So, Jake, Eco Point Antarctica kicks off. This is where we saw the 1v1 Reinhardt battle. Now we're back into 3v3, and we have some substitutions for both teams. For the Outlaws, it's going to be Dante, Mecco, Jexa, and for the Fuel, Doha, Crimzo, 
and Trill. Yeah, I wonder if this will bear out any um, strategy compositions here. It looks like the outlaws have made an oopsie. Yeah, <laughs> they... Say, uh, to be fair, <laughs> each team gets one, I'd say. Each team gets one. <laughs> yeah, needs needs to be a restart. They said that uh, they were AFK at the beginning. So we'll probably go back to lobby and get that selected. They had two DPS players uh, or two DPS heroes selected did the Outlaws. We had a McCree and a Mayan. In fairness, the teams do have to decide their compositions, you know, in between rounds or with a fairly short lead up. The rosters may be chosen before the match, but the compositions are not. You have to be responsive. So coaches can't really contribute too much to that process, I'd say, because there's not much time. Yeah, exactly. And I think it's going to be uh, heavily dependent on the, the circumstances changing pretty rapidly, right? Like you're just like, what if you won rounds, then certain heroes are eliminated from the pool and you've got to manage building a comp with uh, limited availability here. Outlaws have a nice balance. I think both teams have a nice balance opener here centered around the Orisa, but with different uh, DPS and supports to back her up. Already going to blow the Orisa pick this earlier on uh, in the game. Only the losing team will be able to keep playing Orisa going forward. That was a nice halt there. Nicely done. Good setup. Mecco a little bit low, though. He has his shield thrown up, and there'll be plenty of time now for Jex to keep him healed. Doha halted out into the open, almost going down. That's how... That's how lethal that halt can be, uh, especially in this 3v3. Big difference here is that Jexa is going to deal substantially more shield damage uh, than Crimzo can manage to keep up. But Crimzo's nano boost could be a major turning point if this fight ever goes close range. And who are you nanoing? I guess you're just going to try and nano the Torbjorn and have him just slam down shields with overcharge. Could be Torb, could be Orisa even. I think that's a fine nano target, uh, at least in a three on three matchup. It's all about the raw damage. And Orisa actually does quite a lot if you're shooting a shield and hitting every shot. Mecco low, Jexa even lower. Immortality field has to be produced now for the Outlaws to stay alive under all that pressure. And this is an opening for Dallas. They push forward. They throw the Hulk, shield falling from Echo, and Doha goes in. He gets nano boosted now, and he's supercharged. Mecco crumbles, the rivet gun doing damage, and Doha lays waste. Oh, a molten core to finish off. It wasn't needed, but I still appreciate the flex. Yeah, I think the Torb ended up equalizing that damage advantage. Torb being a bit, a bit, pressure, bit better at pressuring shields, excuse me, than Soldier. Uh, and then, of course, that nano boost just charges so quickly. It's up far before the amplification matrix on the side of the outlaw. So ultimate tempo, really, really significant, even in these three on three matches, especially uh, for heroes like Ana who can build it so quickly. And so that also means that, you know, while damage may not see significant, seem significant in a 3v3 because it can be healed up by a support, damage done still builds that ultimate. And those ultimates are big game breakers now and there's less uh, heroes on the battlefield uh, than there would be in a 6v6. Also, the more healing you can do, Ergo, the more damage your team takes without it being lethal. The more quickly you can get things like that nano boost online. Now it's going to be Zenyatta 76 and Roadhog here. So it feels like the Fuel are trying to play a bit more passive and actually just sort of pull the Outlaws around the map. I think the big advantage for the Fuel here is that they can split up much more effectively with their comp. Although Mecco is charging in, trying to catch Crimson. This is a great play. You need to catch that Zenyatta. Don't let him flank you anymore. Take them off one by one. Now Trill, though, is hunting Mecco. Mecco needs a bit of support on the low ground, but Jexa is pressured as well. Great hold though, Doha's in a bit of trouble now. He has to scurry away with the sprint. Trill gonna try and do something here. He finally gets a chance to take a breather and get that health back, but it was too late to save Doha. And now against the Bastion, Orisa and Batiste, there is no hope. And both teams now have used their opportunities to have Orisa in their comp. She's out of the pool for both teams. Now the real fun can begin. <laughs> oh, yeah. More Roadhog, perhaps, from both sides. More flanking play. More splitting up teams instead of sticking together. So a different play style might be heralded here. Maybe something crazy like the Wrecking Ball or the Orion Heart if they want to keep playing close by. Three, Very two, different compositions come out. One. The Echo Mercy, once again, for the Fuel. It worked for them last time. We'll see if it works again. And there's no hit scan on the side of the Outlaws and only a Lucio for heals. So it's going to be very difficult to deal with Doha here. He's going to have so much power with this Mercy constantly pocketing it. There's no Hulk either. So how can they even get Doha to stay in position? It seems almost impossible. Let's see if Troll can knock some of the Outlaws plays out into the open and allow Doha to find that damage. Focusing Beam is so nasty against Tank whenever low half health. Focusing beam, shield broken. It has to be a wall used by Dante now. And frantically, the Outlaws are trying to buy themselves a little bit of time. 
Yeah, this is a tough one for the Outlaws. It's so easy for Doha to just poke in constantly. So difficult for Jexa to heal up his teammates. They're just hiding in the corner. I think this is what Outlaws have to do. I think they just need to wait for the point to open up. Uh, go for a contest play and try and win in a quick fight. Because I think in an extended engagement, Doha is just going to carve them up. Doha now. Not content to wait for that to happen, Jake. Not really fancying sticking around to wait for the point to open up. So they're trying to put some pressure at least as much as they can on Jex's healing. There's no burst healing available for the Outlaws right now. Lucio only heals over time. Much in the same way as Mercy, except Mercy's a bit faster. Mercy's single target. And looks like Trill has taken a bit of damage. He's not being ministered to yet by Crimzo, but he will be. Here, that point starts to open now in 20 seconds time. Doha's gonna have that copy, and if he turns into Reinhardt, this is almost an unwinnable circumstance for the Outlaws. Uh, I don't know how the Outlaws are gonna be managed to do this one. Trill can contest the point for so long if he needs to. That's a great point. Two tanks available. Essentially, the Fuel are able to break the rules in terms of our composition stipulations by copying the Reinhardt, and that definitely seems to be the pick. Doha goes in though, goes a little bit low. Good damage, focusing beam now. He's looking for the Lucio Jexes low, but he's about to get a sound barrier, trying to get away. No, it's a copy on May. Darth oh, wasn't ready for it. He has to quickly go on a high spot, but the charge comes in. This takes Doha out of duplicate form. Now he's gonna go back to the skies, but that sound barrier makes so much durability here for the Outlaws, and Crimzo's already down. There's no healing. Doha has to find kills without a healer. Desperately trying to stay above the fight here. One more Bay Icicle, and he is done for. Trill down a half health as well. He gets a minefield, but he can't bait anyone in. He still found Jexa, though. This makes it a 2v2. Doha flying above. Dante takes a lot of damage from the Sticky Bombs and has to back away. Focusing Beam, trying to get that shield for Mecho low, and it works. Try shots from the background. It's a 1v1, and now it's Dante versus Doha. Both are low on health. Dante, the oh. focusing beam takes him down, and that has to be the best round that we have seen today, all the way to the wire. Oh my, I thought Doha really messed that up. Copying May and then getting pinned out of the copy almost instantly. He's not getting any value off his ultimate. Uh, Jaxa did such a good job dodging there, but it was Doha and Trill who made it work in the long fight there. Trill just spinning to win on point, and Doha somehow managing to stay alive on 35 HP for almost 60 seconds there. That was an incredibly close fight. Jake, you teased that at the start of the round. You said the Outlaws didn't have any hit scan. They didn't have anything to keep the Echo in check. This time, the Fuel probably knew they were going to be dealing with Dante on Echo, so they at least take a Soldier 76 to pressure it down. Mecho, though, is on the tracer. They actually have two DPSs. Let's <laughs> uh, <laughs> just break the rules again. Oh, no, we got to oh, troll. Why have you done this? Right, well, we might need to see a restart of this round uh, at 2-1. to one. And uh, because we're restarting the map, we'll have to keep that score in mind because that won't be tracked on the HUD anymore. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, sal the, salty, uh, the salty picks here from the Outlaws. It's a round forfeit for the Outlaws. So they're actually going to give a round over to the Fuel because they, again, seem to not have understood the rules. Yeah, I hate to see it, but that's the way it's going to be. So it'll be three to one. Oh, wow. Well, I can't believe they did that. <laughs> oh. Okay, so the Outlaws were supposed to forfeit that round. We have to restart. So it's going to be three to one in favor of the Dallas Fuel. <laughs> that was just so difficult, man. I don't know. Either way, uh, the reason why, of course, is that we have rules. All right, it's one DPS, one support, one healer. Pretty simple, right? I feel like, you know, that's uh, easy enough to follow. The Outlaws uh, started that round with two DPSs. Now, as we reset the map, we also sort of have to reset the lockdowns. Uh, so, uh, I, and the players have to remember what they won with. Wait, so were, was, were the fuel up 2-1 at that point? And that yeah, should be the series one. over, right? And it's, it's just like they... Oh, they were, oh. Outlaws just messed up and forfeited one of the one of the 3v3 rounds. Still winnable for the Outlaws, yeah. but they're going to be kicking themselves for that stupid mistake. <laughs> Doha says, yes, you are guilty, they... Mecco. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Well... Dexter is trying to butter us up a little bit more, I think, uh, after that one. So we're going to be going to Castillo in just a second. That uh, was uh, the match going over towards the Outlaws there. So they uh, will take that. They will go off a two and one in this series. We all got a bit confused there, even me, somehow. <laughs> I blame the players. They threw off my groove. 
Yeah, a bit odd enforcing the 1-1-1 one, one, one rule set. But to be fair, that's on the outlaws, you know? <laughs> like, we've already had one reset each team, and those were at the first round, which I think is a little bit more forgivable. You're, you're not ready to pick your hero. You're not thinking about what to do yet. Um, yeah, you got to be careful with that. Same thing can happen in the Overwatch League, technically. If, you know, a little known fact is that if you actually pick the wrong roles in the Overwatch League, if you are a DPS player and your team locks all the heroes and, and you're on support, you're playing support that game. There's no restarting. There's no going back. So it's, you know, it's, that's a real skill in Overwatch League. Don't pick the wrong role. I think we had that once. Oh, was it the Outlaws that did that? I think it was... Was it? I want to say it might have been in stage four last year. I think it was. I mean, you you would know. I don't remember that. I, well, maybe you wouldn't. But I also wasn't playing it was, in the stage four. I don't want to hang you out to drive. That, that, that's true. That's true. You were big chilling. Maybe. Okay. Well, someone could correct me on that one in chat. But I know it happened at least once in the league, and it, it, it caused a problem because we. Are, I think we. I think we had to restart the map because there was a violation. It was like and uh, there was like three DPS or something. Mm. It wasn't like the wrong player was on DPS or whatever. It wasn't something you could just continue with. But yes. If you are a support and you pick DPS and there is the DPS to pick support, you have to stick to those uh, in the league. I think we have a little bit of uh, leniency to that now uh, as, as you know, communication becomes a little bit harder. But clearly communication has been hard inside the Outlaws camp there because neither uh, Jexa nor, or was it Mecha nor Dante could decide who was playing DPS. Although you would think it wouldn't be that difficult, but here we are. So that's three maps down. It is two and one right now, favoring the fuel. So the Outlaws had to forfeit that round which means the fuel uh, might end up getting themselves here uh, a map pick after uh, what we saw Zachary triumphing over Lynx right was it Lynx that triumphed over Zachary no Zachary ended up taking I mean, that one securing that um, there we go it was Zachary that 1v1 round so I mean as you said fuel they're cruising toward multiple map picks Outlaw is going to be suffering when it comes to the six on six if they have no map picks under their belt it's pretty rough to play into all your opponent's best maps one after the other that's something that we don't see in the Overwatch League at least if you're losing you have you know, some hope, at least the map will static. You know, you know what you're going into. It's not necessarily advantage for one team or the other. But if you're just right. picking each map one after the other, it's not guaranteed wins, but it certainly gives you the edge. You can practice and actually think about the practice requirement. How easy is that for the fuel? If they have a lot of map picks in a row, you can just practice exactly one of each map type and be like, we're going to play this map. You know, we can force you to that. Yep. So I think this is going to be a big it advantage. Is, it is actually... It is brutal. I, I do wonder how much lead up. I, I, I assume once the maps are chosen, which you'll uh, be able to see if you're uh, watching uh, live on television in Texas, um, I, I, I do wonder uh, whether the teams will have enough lead into that. But, you know, giving the other team, like, let's say there's a world where all of the maps get to be chosen by one of these teams, or four of them at least get to be chosen. There are uh, not many situations in, in competitive play where one team is allowed to choose all the maps in a series. Normally, loser picks in, in a lot of formats. I mean, even uh, for double elimination brackets, we don't uh, we don't actually allow uh, you know the the team from the upper bracket to choose all the maps. That's considered too great an advantage, even though they're uh, in the upper bracket. It's actually a subject of much debate, and it differs by game. So. It is, a, it is a gigantic handicap to get yourself, uh, and that's why these teams have to be sort of winning in these 3v3 uh, head-to-heads. There is not much room for uh, forfeiting too many more rounds and, and giving them away. But Map 4 will be starting in just a moment here. Nice to hear from everyone out there on Twitter uh, who have been commenting on the matches so far. We hope you continue enjoying as you watch live here on YouTube. Okay, Closer and Gamsu, uh, Dante Meko Jexa. So uh, no changes here for the Houston Outlaws, but we do see a bit of a switch up for the Dallas Fuel. We see that uh, no Doha, Crimson, and Trilla are still in the lobby. A lot of these players are still waiting by, and even the, even the coaches uh, are sticking around to see how this one unfolds. And maybe they are deciding the compositions. I don't know how busy the coaches are. Maybe they've got nothing to do, Jay. I mean, I bet they're watching and maybe maybe dropping some input. You know, I think coaching in esports is a bit of a touchy subject because it's hard to find um, the right amount of influence to have on the team. You know, you look at traditional sports um, where the games are a lot older and a lot more solved, you might say, that the coaches have sure. a lot of impact. You know, they really understand what's the best way to play. But these games change so fast. Sometimes players have the best knowledge of, of how to play, what the most effective strategies are. So I think as a coach, you have to balance that role as a mediator and a leader uh, with the true coaching role, like just strictly gameplay stuff. So um, I would say both these teams are examples of, of teams that do that well, though. Coaches that know how to have impact and be a positive part of the team without taking over and stifling the creativity of their players. Well, let's see how it plays out now because the players definitely have the opportunity to select their compositions. And it looks like the Outlaws come out with 
Look, outwardly, it looks a little bit weaker as a composition, right? Doom Zaya uh, plus the Brig. Uh, but the Fuel are doing a similar thing. No one's going for, you know, the big red button of the Orisa yet. They're trying to see if they can sneak a round win with a, a suboptimal composition. And you, you hinted that beforehand. You said that could be a big difference maker here. Decay already pushing in very aggressively. You can see that he dived the back line, but there wasn't much to be found as he realized that there's a Brig and a Zaya looking at him. TK getting a ton of damage in. He's going to be pretty much out of control in this matchup. There's no hero who can really shut down the Tracer besides the Brig. And Decay's wise to that. You know, he's going to respect that uh, Brig and always play at range. So Alnaz can probably need to take out closer to get an advantage in this one. I don't see Decay as too viable of a target here. If Jexa can get that rally charged up, though, that will be absolutely devastating. That armor will persist for quite a while, which is the brutal part. Obviously, the healing given from rally and then the sort of persisting armor hard to break through and tracer is especially weak against armor because armor applies on each hit and tracer's pulse pistols actually produce lots of small hits so all of those hits are reduced by the armor percentage instead of overall so it affects her more closer my man goes to the high ground gets a boop on dante finishes him off and now the damage the threat that the outlaws were supposed to be able to produce with this composition is all but gone stick. pulse bomb jexa had nowhere to run he tried to shield bash away but the bomb was stuck to him not his shield and mecco trying to give us a light show and that's all he could do from that position oh mecco in the corner just knows that it's rough jexa calling out dante in the chat by the way that was a nice separation why is play, he though, always by, dying by first fuel. nice play to them to just play it slow cautious wait for that doom to abuse his cooldowns and then uh pick them apart one by one that started to look good for the outlaws looked like they might be getting close to that rally but decay with the stick and that's a huge boost now. I mean, the Dallas Fuel what? managed to win around with like a, a weaker composition on paper and they go for another weirder one, right? Sigma with Ash and with Mercy. Now, I don't know how this deals with a Tracer uh, outside of, you know, trying to accretion the Tracer. But what do you think about these comps? Oh, this is interesting. Dante as well in the Wrecking Ball. So a composition swap a little bit and a big dive coming in for the Outlaws. They're trying to take down Decay first. Okay, trying to get some high ground, but again, not a lot of mobility. Only the coach gun is there, but closer. Somehow gets the resurrect. Almost stayed alive long enough. Mecha was able to work him down. It's still two left, and yeah, okay. I like I like the creativity. There's a bit of spice there from the fuel, but the composition just doesn't have the mobility. Yeah, I think that comp could have been really effective against a slower strategy with like a Rhine or an Orisa, because there's so much damage available to that Ash and Sigma. But of course, dive composition is so good against Ash, it's really difficult for her to escape him. And we saw exactly that there, her dying twice, even with the res coming in from closer. He has no choice there but to res. There's no hope if he doesn't, but Dante just too good on the hand. I love to see that the comp swaps coming out from Houston, playing different heroes on different roles. Um, as long as they don't mess up and forfeit rounds. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The Fuel are going to try this one again. I mean, they can try it as much as they like. Eventually, they're going to have to switch to stronger comps if this doesn't work out. So it's going to be the Echo and the Mercy with the Roadhog. And Gamsu already gets caught. I mean, Mecho can walk through the shield. Kinetic Grasp from Sigma doesn't stop the hook. It's too large an object. And I mean, it can't. I mean, Defense Matrix doesn't stop it either. So now it's just Ash and Mercy. And Dallas Fuel, this composition for them might just be on its last legs, I think. They're going to burn through this one closer still, though, showing his Mercy skills. Gets Gumsy back up. Gumsy's trying to find Jexa now. Look for him for an accretion, but he got chased down by Dante. Sticky bombs get rid of the Sigma, and Closer was an easy finish. Nice comp around the Echo Mercy, actually, with the Roadhog. I think that actually has better synergy than, than the Hammond does, because Roadhog, so self-sufficient, can kind of go on his own and create space. Uh, and then Jexa is just completely free to pocket Dante 24-7. And... I think that really has the impact that round. Dante picking up all three kills. Yeah, he's uh, already shown us in the Overwatch League just how powerful he is an Echo three, player. And two, I mean, the, the fact that one, he's such a flexible individual right. with the knowledge of so many different Match heroes just only adds to his efficacy uh, as an Echo. So, Diva is going to be here. So, Decay and Close are going to play the Mercy here. I guess this comp really feels like it wants to protect Decay as much as possible. It's going to be Sombra, Winston, and the Moira here. A bit of dive element. See what Dante can do with his vaunted tracer. Closer already feeling the heat. Has to run right away. This now leaves Gamsu on his own. The Diva has to fend for itself. The K quickly tries to return to the fray. And Neko goes down. The focusing beam. What a game turner. Yeah, I think the hack is pretty much a necessity here for Dante and Jexa. But losing Winston is going to be a death blow to this comp. You kind of have to make it work in the first dive, but Gomsu and Decay did a great job canceling Dante's hacks. If he gets one hack there, I think that fight goes very differently, but canceling all those hacks, Sombra just doesn't feel so effective. And now it's match point here. 
And this uh, could be a decider. If Dallas win this round, they will be choosing map two of the battle for Texas. And we'll see maybe the Orisa comes out or an Orisa counter composition because uh, this is it. So you can use what you have left. And yes, uh, unsurprisingly, both teams go for Orisa. I love the Junkrat pick here for Decay, Jay. Oh, yeah, I know what POV I'm watching this game. <laughs> this actually should be a big advantage for Outlaws, but Decay is sneaking up on the flank on the Junkrat. Ooh, this is my style right here. He needs miss. to get a kill, though. Yeah, a bit of miscommunication. That goes the off map. That goes so close. All right, Decay didn't actually manage to line up his, uh, his remote mine with the Holt. He actually threw it away from where the Holt was. Again, Closer wants to push forward. He got Mecha on no. the map. That's huge. How can the Outlaws come back from this? They have a McCree and they have a Batiste. Two heroes with some hits camp potential, but there's the shield in their way, Jake. And the plan worked out, but it wasn't about the, uh, the junk rat at all. It turns out the Brig was the difference maker. Yeah, that poop off the map is absolutely massive. Should be an easy kill, but the immortality field, very effective here. Decay, not manage to take. Oh, he does manage to take out Jexa. Pipe to the foot. Dante with half HP on his last legs. This has to be Dallas Fuel taking the series. Dante, not happy at all. Two health and a dream up against three players. This one, oh, may have been already decided, but Decay's gone down. He finds some shots, but then he knows he has to run in and face his fate. And the Dallas Fuel secure yet another map choice here in the battle for Texas. They managed to win out our 3v3 with a score of three to one. Not quite as close as the 1v1s win, but we definitely got to see some creative compositions in those rounds. The Brig play looks so good. The play of the match looks like it's gonna go to Dante here with his Wrecking Ball play. And he said, you know, his team didn't trust him. His team said he was a troll on Wrecking Ball, but he dominated that round. <laughs> yeah, that was actually a pretty next level round on Wrecking Ball. Got, I think, all four kills that round. Didn't finish off the Mercy, but just a huge impact play on the Wrecking Ball. The boop off it adds insult to injury there. It's really what you're what you're dreaming of on Wrecking Ball. You can get kills with the slam and the primary weapon, but the boop off the map, ooh, that's what you want. It's massive. I mean, especially high health pool targets getting the knockoff here. Here is your Jack Link's instant replay, of course, official protein partner of the Dallas Fuel. And and that was that last uh, that last round with Dante having to go it alone. Dante managed to get the K there. But I mean, the way we got there, they lost their Orisa. I mean, you're Orisa, Jake, and you get knocked off the map by a whip shot. You've got to be hating life. Oh man, you mean you can't come back from that. Losing an Orisa to a boop off the map. <laughs> I mean, Dante did a nice clutch play there to take out Decay, but you're on one HP facing an Orisa and a Brig. So how do you how do you think you're gonna win that? I don't know. Well, you don't. Uh, I don't I... think it's really possible with that. Aside for some serious throws. Yeah. Now you felt that the the McCree and Batiste comp actually had an advantage sort of at the start of that round. What were you sort of basing that on up against the sort of Junkrat Brig uh, Orisa setup? Well, I think if McCree and Batiste can set up at long range, they will break the shield first, which is what it's all about right. when you're in an Orisa mirror. It's only Junkrat and Orisa spamming shield. Brig doesn't really add anything to that. Um, whereas you've got McCree and Batiste and Orisa all, all along the side of the outlaws. Um, and Junkrat won't even be able to shoot all the time because once his shield goes down, uh, he's gonna be struggling to put out that same level of damage. So I kind of wish Outlaws played that slower, maybe taking a, a passive rollout to the left side, coming on the high ground. If they can play that at long range where Junkrat really suffers, uh, and same with Brigida, then I think that is a pretty easy comp advantage for them, but they go up straight up into the right side. And in that location, the Junkrat and, Br and Brig are pretty effective, actually, not, not too bad of a pick at all. I mean, we saw the K close the gap by creeping uh, out of line of sight of the underside of the map. And there was supposed to be a set play there. It was a halt into Remote Mine, but the Remote Mine went to, uh, the halt sort of dragged uh, the, the Outlaws off the stairs. And then the Remote Mine was supposed to go towards where the stairs was, but it missed. It still didn't matter, but it could have been very dicey after that play didn't work out, but it was just this hero play with the Brig to knock uh, off the Orisa. That was incredible. What a way to start off our battle for Texas, of course, our Lone Star Showdown. I can't wait to see what these teams have to bring in our second round of skill challenges. We will have more 1v1s and, one, uh, and 3v3s coming up because there's still two more maps for that final 6v6 battle for Texas to be decided. Uh, and... Uh, we get a bit of time to build anticipation for that one because uh, that one will be going down next week. But Jake, uh, what are your sort of final thoughts here on what we've seen from these two teams? Does this give you any indication on how you should expect the 6v6 to go? Or is this just really just a teaser and a chance to put these players through their paces like we see the NFL draft kind of thing? 
Well, I mean, we saw these teams in the Overwatch League take it to f five maps in an incredibly close series. Both teams making huge plays to extend that series so long. So uh, the one ones and the three v threes went essentially the same way, almost always going to that final map, uh, final uh, hero matchup in the series. So just showing that these teams are incredibly closely matched. I think that's a really exciting place for the battle for Texas to be. Uh, it's no fun if it's a stomp, but when both these teams are good and both these teams are actually not only close to each other in relative terms, but also strong relative to the rest of the Overwatch League, um, both having pretty strong performances in franchise history this season. So I think it's very possible we could see these teams matching up in playoffs and beyond in the Overwatch League. Um, and they seem very, very closely matched in the 1v1 and 3v3. Uh, should be same for 6 on 6. Yeah, I mean, it's a great time to be a fan of Texas Overwatch. Either of these teams are hopefully going to bring you some joy going forward in the Overwatch League. If you're in Texas, be sure to tune in to WFAA8 in Dallas and KHOU11 in Houston at noon on Saturday to find out what the winners of our series chose to do with their map picks and also catch the docu-series about the Lone Star Showdown, give you a little bit more content related to this huge head-to-head -head and yeah, also start to build some anticipation and understand a little bit more about what these teams are choosing map-wise now. Remember, Dallas has two map picks and that is huge. So here's our schedule. Remember, don't forget to tune in next week. We've seen series one and two but still, Series 3 and 4 are, again, 1v1 and 3v3 challenges to decide who gets those map picks. And finally, May the 18th, that is when we will have the culmination, the final showdown, the battle for Texas, where we crown the top team in Texas. It is a crown that's passed hands many times over the years and will continue to go back and forth, but the bragging rights will rest with one of our teams at that point. Also want to take this opportunity to thank Samsung as the presenting sponsor of the Lone Star Showdown. None of this would be possible without them. Thank you for getting on board. Thank you for helping us shine a light and showcase some of the incredible talent we have residing in our Texas Overwatch League teams. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, that is going to be it. Thank you so much for joining us for our first leg of the Home Star, the Lone Star Showdown, should I say. We're at home. I guess it's a Home Star Showdown. And we'll be back next week with our rounds three and four. So don't go too far. Many memories from today. Hammer kills, 1v1s, 3v3s. We'll see you for more of the same in a week's time. To stay cool, don't forget to yee and haw. We'll see you next time. The Houston Outlaws and the Dallas Fuel wish to thank Samsung for presenting the 2020 Lone Star Showdown. Follow us over the next three weeks to see who is named the top Overwatch team in Texas. In life, there are people who hike with poles and drink their meals, and people who feed on Jack Link's jerky, a protein snack made with 100% beef. Because in life, you either run with Sasquatch or you run from Sasquatch. Hey guys, it's Blank from Houston Outlaws and this is our day with Zenny. I um, play Overwatch 16 hours per day. I've had a lot of issues with my eyes in the past. The more I play, the more tired my eyes get. They showed us a presentation on how blue light filters work, how it can help your eyes, your health, your performance. With Zenny's glasses, they feel more natural part of your style or your fashion. With these glasses specifically, it's very hard to tell a difference. So I think every gamer can actually benefit from them. It'll help your eyes without taking away from the gameplay.